Okay, welcome. This is the next episode of the Comedy Guy podcast, and it's an episode that I've wanted to do for a while. I have my friend with me. He is a Comedy Estonia comedian. He's performed with us for a couple of years, and he's also a current serving member of the Estonian Army, Orki Ot. Welcome. Yeah. Hello. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Cool, man. So you are currently serving in the Estonian Army, and it's not just a mandatory. You've done that, right? Yeah, I finished my mandatory about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I, you know, started working there. I think I liked it. Okay. What's your current rank or position or where are you at? Current rank is uh, sergeant. So three stripes sergeant if anybody's... How do the ranks go? So when you start, when, you, when you're in the mandatory part, what rank are you? And then how do you go up from there? Uh, when you're in mandatory, you start as a private. Mm-hmm. And then you work on from there because there are like uh, two... Um, how do I say it? Uh, the people come in two runs. The first is 11 months, and then there are eight months. When you're in 11 months, then you become a leader. Or Can you, know, you elect to go into that, or how do you get in the short or the long one? First off, if you like have uh, strong uh, leadership qualities in you, then you become a leader. And if you don't have any, you become a leader too, but you're just, you know, trying trucks. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, but when you come to uh, eighth month, you can also become a little bit of leader, but, you know, a small fraction. You can get to corporal. Uh, there are two, uh, because there are, like, uh, two classes, I think, in the army. There are, like, leaders and soldiers. Mm-hmm. When you're a soldier, you're a private or a corporal. Uh, when you're a leader, you start with uh, sergeants and go upwards. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So that's where you're at right now. So I guess even before that, let's, uh, I mean, we'll back up before we get into the army, before we talk about leadership and my, all this stu- shit, which everybody knows I love talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you know, been doing, com- when was, when did you first do a comedy? How old were you first did Comedy Estonia show? Oh, I think I was 16. Jesus. I was I in the... Ninth grade, I think, maybe eighth. <laughs> and did we feed you alcohol before you were? Yeah, you, know, you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said that uh, if you want, you can. I, it was at uh, the venue is now closed. Uh, it was near uh, Coca Cola Plaza. Oh, um, protest or protest? Was it protest? Yeah, oh, yeah no. I went there. The first thing there, I hi Lewis, and I hit my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, yeah, those arches yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. and there. Uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm Lewis. You can have a beer if you want, and uh, we'll be calling your name. I was like, "Oh yeah, a beer." <laughs> and then I went to the, uh, the bar and was like, "Yeah, I want to have a beer." <laughs> How old are you? No, no, no. I'm from Comedy Estonia. <laughs> <laughs> did that work? It did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, these days we've got so many young people. These days, uh, Cold is like 15 or something. Oh. Cold. He's yeah. Know, he's, uh, then we've got uh, Steven and Jakob are both eighteen. Uh, who else is in there? Cyril. I don't remember Cyril Loud. When she's sixteen, but she used to do it with us when she was twelve. Like she was standing up and part of. Now she's sixteen. She's doing the gigs again, and it's awesome, mate. It's awesome to to see loads of young people. Yeah, I think one of my uh, actually friends was uh, beginning to do do open mics. Uh, Ralph was his name. Ralph. Oh. His last name. But yeah, he was like uh, two years older than me, mm. uh, uh, younger. And we went to the same school. We almost did a band together, I think, at one point. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, at one point I like, saw him at the Gomez Estonia the sign-ups. Mm-hmm. I was like, Ralph, the fuck, Ralph? <laughs> so yeah, you haven't, but you haven't, I mean, I, I guess you've been focusing on your career in the army for a while, right, Dan? Yeah, because I, uh, at one point I, um, I think I have to choose. Do I want to be like an uh, artist or do I want to be like in the army? I guess I can do both, but there's always this like stigma when I go to work hmm. and uh, I get new uh, soldiers coming in and they're like, I saw him at open mic. He fucking bombed. <laughs> <laughs> like the fuck they do then, right? Maybe. But I, I might guess that 
is that because maybe you're not that far above them that maybe as you progress and you become more confident and you're maybe you go up a rank, I don't know, or then you become more confident as a leader to be able to project an image that you are confident that you uh, don't take yourself seriously, but you take this work seriously. Like maybe then there is a possibility to meld them, but I agree it it's not an obvious ability to be able to combine them. Yeah, the them. thing is that uh, most of the guys that come in, uh, half of them are older than me. <laughs> 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 and like... Uh, I'm coming to work and there's like uh, a guy with like full beard and like tats everywhere. He's mm. gone to jail like four fucking times. And I have to uh, tell him how to put the, uh, how to trust himself, like uh, how we need it to be. Mm. And there's always, for me, it was like, but he's a fucking father, you know? <laughs> he has a kid that may be older than me, but doesn't necessarily have to be. But yeah. And also like, um, because uh, in the past I was a comedian, like I'm still am, I think. And uh, right now, when I work, uh, when I have to give classes, because uh, uh, most of my job uh, for the guys that come into uh, mandatory, uh, I have to talk to them a lot in front of a class, mm. and I still take it like I'm as a comedian. And every time I finish the class and I didn't get one laugh, I'm like. <laughs> the fuck did I do wrong? <laughs> I bombed. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's always like this in the back of my head, like, mm. okay, right now I'm going to talk about this. Uh, make this point, this point, this point. Now, could be a pretty good punchline. <laughs> <laughs> and when I do it and it doesn't work, <laughs> it uh, like... It was funny, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you could have a tough audience, although maybe, you know, sometimes the deflating tension can be a way to get a laugh, or it's just, yeah, who'd have thought the army's a tough crowd sometimes? But, yeah. uh, I think uh, a lot of my jokes uh, in the, uh, when I give it to the soldiers are like, uh, especially when they're new, are like uh, uh, military jokes. And uh, for like uh, guys that have been in the military for a long uh, time, they like get it. Mm. But, when the soldiers come in and make a military joke, they're like, huh? what? <laughs> yeah, okay. they don't get it, right? Yeah, yeah. But again, like, this is why, like, we had a few uh, army comedy nights. Like, mm. Two, I think, at least. Uh, right, there was one. Uh, I remember the yeah, last two, one I was at Paldiski. Yeah, there were two at Paldiski. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And they were like, uh, that's why I think it's better to do, uh, do them at the end of the year because they're like... Um, in there, right? So you're like used to it. Mm. So it isn't like a um, uh, new situation for them. And then I can do my military jokes. <laughs> good, a bit yeah. And they like <laughs> it. Then they get it. And then it like feels good. I guess so as well at the end of the year. Like it's a reward. It's not just like, hey, welcome to your mandatory service. Here's the comedy <laughs> show. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, you got to go do your shit and then, you know, be part of it. And then you get a reward for it. Yeah, they were really fun, man. Uh, and it was really cool to go out on the base and. Um, and, and I know that, uh, you guys, you guys had a, a really tricky situation with the lockdown because you guys were all locked on the base for a long time and you got a whole bunch of, uh, soldiers not knowing how to amuse themselves or keep active or, or whatnot. And you were all locked. How was that time? Uh, you were on Paldiski base, were you? No, I was okay. at, uh, me myself was at Yuffie mm -hmm. because it's a tricky situation right now because I work in Kalevi Infantry Battalion right now. And uh, right back then, it was in the stage where it was moving bases, right? We were moving from Baildiski to Yuffie. Mm. And it's like 250 kilometers or something like that, right? And half of our soldiers were at Baildiski or uh, somewhere in the Mufts and half were in uh, Yuffie. Right, uh, in Yuffie, uh, it was dark, man, because uh, we couldn't uh, we couldn't go to the cafeteria. We had to uh, eat on the floor. So why not the cafeteria? Isn't it still in the base? Still in the it's clean in the base, zone? But uh, in the cafeteria, there are civilian people working there, hmm. so we couldn't have any contact with them because they can go uh, home. Mm -hmm every day of the week because they work in the like for a private uh, firm hmm. and uh, were they cooking your food and then what somehow they 
it'd get sent to you or something. Yeah, they're cooking a food, put it in the thermos, and uh, some guy delivers it to our floor. Dang. And like, we have to get our fucking uh, canteens and start eating it, right? And uh, at one moment, everybody w- was like, the fuck do we do now? Mm. Right? Because there wasn't a store or anything. We had to just get food three times a day. But people could, like, mothers and girlfriends could send uh, packages, right? So, but it was also, like, a weekly occurrence. So if there was a smoker, he ran out of cigarettes, <laughs> right? If somebody was into snooze, he ran out of snooze, right? Hmm. And it was uh, tricky. Did it <laughs> I guess, I don't know. <laughs> I guess you can't say, but I'm like, was it sounds to me like a prison black market will evolve. Like, oh, I, got some, I got some cigarettes. What do you got, man? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, but there's not a lot of currency. It's like euros or cigarettes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> or oops, uh, snooze, right? Yeah. And yeah. But how long did you spend in that environment? Like, and that's like maximum lockdown, I guess. I think it was like two or three months. Fuck. And yeah, because uh, the guys didn't see their girlfriends, mothers. Oh, they're like, going bananas. They need some. Uh, yeah, yeah. What do you need? Uh, but, sexy uh, leave. Uh, but the. We got like uh, the uh, def- defense forces uh, sergeant. He came down there and talked to like why, why it is like it is, hmm. and he made a really good point. Like uh, basically, when there is a war, it's starting to look like this. There's something happening. We can't see it. Some people are dying. We can't like hmm. see it. Right? We don't know how many are affected. Uh, it's like modern guerrilla far- warfare, right? And I think that was a good point, and like uh, it meant something for the soldiers because when you like want to do them, when you want them to do something that they don't want to do, you gotta make a point why they have to do it, right? You gotta uh, explain ex- it. Yeah, explain it. Yeah, and I think that like kind of helped, and also the. Uh, the uh, defense defense forces uh, sergeant who came down, he's the same guy. Uh, were you at Baliski or maybe uh, Army Night? Oh, one of them, but I can't remember which one of that. The last one, one uh, he came down there to watch it too. I think it was. I think it was the last one we did. Yeah, yeah. I was there. Yeah, yeah. He, was he talking to us afterwards? Yeah, the guy, yeah. yeah, that guy. Yeah, he was not. I, mean, I was... almost started laughing because he talked about. Uh, he talked in Estonian, and I just looked at you and like. You don't know what the fuck's going <laughs> on. Dude. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, he's our like, how to say it? A really like important person in the uh, defense forces, and for me, it was like, uh, you know, nice to see him there. That's nice, man. And also, he's like, um, because when he when we do it, the army combat nights, we do it uh, for charity, right? Hmm. And the charity we we give it to, he's like. Uh, not the owner, but he runs it, right? And uh, it was fun. Yeah, I liked it. And, uh, but the corona situation, it was tough because we had a couple of uh, dudes who lived in Sarem at the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, who happened to be watching a volleyball game <laughs> who came to the forest and uh, it turns out one guy had corona and everybody's like full lockdown. Did you guys get tested at all? Uh, yeah, uh, at Bailiski, uh, everybody who ha- was in contact with him uh, did. And when in your feed, were, you were at like coughing or anything, hmm. then too. And uh, have you been tested? Me, myself? Yeah. No, I haven't, no. Uh, fucking gross, yeah. Huh. They have like this big, um, the thing you clean your ears. Yeah, the cotton bud or something. Cotton, cotton bud, tip, yeah. yeah. But this big, no. right? And I felt like somebody was cleaning a toilet <laughs> in my fucking nose, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, tch- and the thing with Corona is try not to sneeze or cough at anybody. And when somebody's <laughs> pushing something up your nose and you're like this, <laughs> try not to sneeze, right? Okay. <laughs> that was fucking gross. Was there any uh, big outbreak inside? I mean, clearly not. I guess you guys all survived. No, no, no. All- uh, because I think that the, the defense force took a lot of measures for it to happen. Like... Uh, Sorry, like standard procedures or something already in place. Is that what you mean? Sorry, or I don't know if they were in place because that's the uh, for the people who run the place. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I think like we had to close a lot of stuff, like battalions. Nobody could move in or out except Mm -hmm. for like the people who worked there, 
but the argument uh, why the people who work there could get uh, like out is because they live like a couple of kilometers from the battalion, right? And why we couldn't let uh, anybody in mandatory service out was because they were like uh, somewhere from Saarema, somewhere from Tartu, like mm. uh, every place of the Estonia, right? And uh, when you let the people who worked there uh, out, it was uh, like a lower risk mm. because they go home, maybe they want to go to the store, but... Uh, they're not going to a nightclub in Tartu, for example. Yeah, yeah. No, they're just going yeah, home. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> but but you boys, you head out. You're going to the nightclub in Tartu. <laughs> like, woo, babank, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly where all the soldiers are going to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, we had uh, strict measures. Like, uh, we were told if somebody breaks the order, mm -hmm. uh, that, for instance, you go to the fucking movie theater or babank or something, you were done. You're not coming back, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet. <laughs> and that like helped because okay. we had a lot of people who like had something to do at the moment like uh one of like had like to uh, have to had to do like the uh hunting man license okay yeah and our uh, company leader told no you can't go yeah right Everything's but off. the dude said i have to go okay go then don't come back yeah <laughs> ever <laughs> like that's it yeah, yeah but to the army you can't come back just if you heard of the word discharge huh yeah man i wish i wish we could have done something i wish we were like talking about it can we set up a stage outside or something like over the gate and broadcast with speakers or something can we like we were like if sanders still had the burger van like me and tim were like we're gonna find sanders old burger van we're gonna make burgers out the front like i don't know catapult them in or something <laughs> boo yeah, yeah. boo but I get it. it was a tough situation for everyone. Like everybody Absolutely. was affected at one point. Absolutely, and it's completely legit. I mean, it's completely legit. To yeah, think but that, like that that's exactly what the, the your your sergeant spoke of. That like, hey, if shit was gonna go down, this is actually how it probably would go down. Yeah, and also we had a speech about like when the second wave comes. Mm, or I would say a sergeant told me mm. that uh, it's already going down in okay. Tartu. Yeah, well, yeah, everyone's yeah. aware of it right now. But uh, right now, I think uh, the defense uh, forces like have a plan or something at least. For instance, like when we're at school, we have to do like um, study far, mm -hmm. but we can't study with our own computers because it's all like in a system. And they're like talking, how do we get the Defense Forces computers and stuff like that. So they're making preparations already. Like, I mean, it makes sense. It's If it's coming or not, it's still it's a reasonable enough chance. Yeah. I'm on the more optimistic side because my welfare depends on it being optimistic. <laughs> uh, but okay, I get it exactly that the army would prepare you. And now we know it's not like first time we're like, what is the pandemic? What's that? Yeah. Like we know exactly how it's going to go down. So you can prepare. Yeah, and also the sergeant uh, from the high-ranking sergeant who came, the boss guy, right? Mm -hmm. He told us like uh, every day, they like uh, think, uh, what is the opportunity that something will some someone something will attack Estonia, and every other day is like fifty-fifty, <laughs> yes or no, but now with the corona, it's like thirty to seventy. Uh, more yes than no, hmm. because like it's a situation, right? Okay, where I mean, yeah, okay. If a country is in that state, they're compromised, they're not working at full potential. Yeah. There's a certain amount of disorder in society, fear. So this would, in theory, be, you know, and uh, apparently our large neighbor off to the east is fine, and they're totally yeah, okay. We can That's say what Russia, because yeah. uh, we have a saying in uh, the defense forces that Latvia is not going to attack us. <laughs> <laughs> North <laughs> Finland or Norway. It's <laughs> if it's going to be, it's a big dude on the left, right? <laughs> That's a very pragmatic attitude. I like that. I wasn't sure whether you know we should be like going. Russia is coming, but okay, no, it's no we're one hoping else. It yeah. Anybody isn't, but if it is, if it is like I don't know. Hmm. North Korea isn't like Estonia is a strategic point strike. It's it's <laughs> fucking Russia, isn't it? Yeah, okay, it's gonna be that. Get the javelins out, the tanks are coming over the border. Yeah. We're good to go. 
Interesting, man. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's fine. No, we should. I, I mean, let's let's go back to the army. I know we sort of diverged on that one and Corona. It was interesting to hear. Uh, I mean, I was interested in basically the, your experiences through lockdown, being there, and and we understand why you were locked down. We understand why your top brass insisted you do that, and that was very good. And there's a great um, lesson there that when yeah, you said it when you need somebody and not just army soldiers. If you're any person, you might be a boss in a workplace. You might be a, a, a parent. You might be anything. When you need to, some people to do something that they don't necessarily want to do, a good, real good start is to tell them the reason why they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, and if you take the army for an example, like we shut the whole thing down. Only certain people could get out and come in, right? Mm. And how much uh, cases do you think we had? How many? Tell me. Uh, I don't know exact number, but I think I'm quite sure it was like under 20. Yeah, okay. Huh. Uh, so it worked. Yeah, it worked. Like Because it's like you can't go in or and you can't get out, right? And I I know it's like frustrating. It's like boring. It's uh, especially for people like mental health issues. Mm. I'm not talking about army. I'm talking about like the... Uh, whole country it's like tough but it works it because you don't get contact with anybody but you have to take uh, the information in that uh, not everybody gets to like uh, get off of it because in the army when you're in mandatory you get free foods like everything like that free electricity you don't have to pay for anything like you get paid for like a uh, hundred days in the month maybe mm-hmm. 175 but if you're a working class citizen, uh, it doesn't just work for you that you're mm. staying home and don't uh, go to work because there's a virus. Mm-hmm. No, I hear what you're saying. Okay, let's go back to your role in the army right now. So you did the mandatory service. Yeah. Uh, did you do, you do the longer version, the 11 month? Yeah, I did a version. 11 month. Yeah. Okay, so you 11. You you you've had a reasonable time. Uh, you clearly don't want to run away so quickly. And you decide you're going to stay on. So when you finished, or tell first of all, tell us about that time and what when your time gets up at the end of your eight or let's say your eleven months. What are your options then? In the I army? think that we should talk about uh, this not at the end of my uh, mandatory service. I think we should okay. start when I finished high school. Yeah. Okay. Because that's when it all started. Hmm. And I finished uh, high school in Tallinn. We were actually doing a open mic there too remember it was like my oh, uh yeah. mister work i think so yeah i remember a school gig yeah yeah, yeah i yeah. think so yeah, yeah, yeah it was there like uh, in english it was uh, Stalin, 32nd high school yeah, yeah 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 i remember that one yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and uh, i finished that school that school and uh, three of my uh, classmates uh all boys and one girl actually we all wanted to do uh, the amount of service as quick as we could and uh, there was one other friend too. And we went to, we wrote a, we wrote a letter to the CARA, Kaiser Resource Summit, the, the bunch who will manage it. And we told that we want to go to Wahi Battalion because it um, has military police in it and we want to be military policemen, right? And we, we told yes and we, we, we got there the four of us, me, Sten, Markus, and Nare. We got on a bus and we are right. And the base is at Tallinn, right? Uh, like two kilometers from here mm-hmm. in Kopilat, I think. We went there with all, we did all our mm, the doctor's appointments, like we got injected uh, stuff and all that. And we were outside having a cigarette. And some sergeant came. I need four volunteers because there is four beds missing and we can't put you asleep, all of them. Like, there were four spots missing, right? And I was like, I'm not fucking going. I want to be here. And then I started to talk Marcus. Uh-huh. And Marcus was already there, right? <laughs> volunteers for what? I didn't understand. He comes and. Uh, volunteers to leave this base. Oh, okay. And go right. To Paliski, right? Right. Yep, yep, yep. And Marcus was like, fuck it, I'm going. He changed his mind quick. You were all like, going to be military police the next... Yeah, yeah. and yeah. the next one, 
was out of it, like, fuck it, I'm going. And me and Stan looked at each other, I was like, fuck this, man. And we went to Tzio. <laughs> and we went to Bailiski, uh, Golavi Infantry Battalion. And I think that it was a good choice for me. Uh, because when we were uh, driving there, it's like uh, the driver told us, why the fuck would you be leaving here? Like, no fucking going into the forest, no anything. Like, you're in the car, like, <laughs> doing your stuff. And I lied to him, and I was like, this is why I came here. I fucking want to be in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> and we got there, and then it was like our soldier's uh, pace course. And that's a, a six-week course when you, like, learn to shoot your rifle, learn to dig a hole, <laughs> learn to eat in the canteen, and all stuff like that, right? Learn mm -hmm. how to walk in, uh, uh, in the formation, all stuff like that. That finished, um, it goes on for six months when you go in the summer or in January. Mm -hmm. And you have to choose or... Do you want to be uh, a car driver, like uh, driving trucks and all stuff like that? Or do you want to uh, be a sergeant? Uh, you want to be a leader? Mm, the two, both of them are pluses and minuses. Like when you uh, want to be a driver, you get your C category, right? And you can use it in the civilian life. Mm. And if you want to be a sergeant, the only good thing is that you get to lead and you don't get anything out of it uh, for the civilian life. <laughs> but they're working out like some kind of system like when you're a leader in the mandatory, you get like a diploma or something that uh, mm. you were leading people. And maybe you can like, when you want to go to a high school that uh, like KBS or something that you can show it like I was a leader in. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I'll be, uh, cause I was about to hit you up on that one and be like, what do you mean you don't get nothing? You get leadership training and you get experience being a military leader, which has directly transferable skills yeah, but to real is, life. Like, a lot of people want to uh, go to, to a truck driver yeah. because they think like, I got a C category out of it. I can like become bus driver or something like anything. Well, like, I mean, that sounds like the vastly different worldviews. If I think that getting a C, like... Getting a C license. I mean, I can just go get one. Yeah, but you get it for free. Oh, gee. <laughs> and they're like, uh, in their thoughts, they're like uh, holding on to like 800 euros. Yeah. But yeah, right, 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 right. If you've got though any, I mean, I'm not, oh, look, it's a legit thing to drive a truck, to drive a bus, but it, it seems like really narrow. Even when you said it, it's like your choice is being a leader or being a driver. I'm like, how many drivers do you guys need? You can. It's a big bus. You can fit like fifty guys on one bus. What do you need? Like one yeah, for fifty. Yeah, but we don't drive around in buses. We drive around like uh, armored vehicles. There's okay. like eight people can get uh, to mm. uh, eight people like in one of them. Okay. Right. So does this then reflect? So because I would look at that and and say, oh yeah, I want the army leadership experience, and that's the valuable thing. Now, are you sort of implying though, by your, cause you're like, oh, maybe they'll give us a certificate. And I'm like, who gives a shit about a certificate? You've got real leadership experience. I don't need a certificate, but are you by that implying that the private sector on the most part is not sort of straight up recognizing that the yeah, leadership but, experience uh, that they're getting? Everybody doesn't want to be a leader, right? Uh, okay. Because we have guys coming in from who worked like four years straight in Finland and now they have like an envelope that says you have to come here and go to a forest and shoot like something. And they don't want to be a leader, right? Yeah, okay. If they get to choose if they want to lead people or get it uh, out of their minds, out of their way, hmm. and also get a C driver's license, right? Which one do you think? They sure. Would like? Now I'm not knocking that, right? No, and that's I I, get, I totally get that. There's a certain that's a, a and that's a legit thing to do. I don't want to knock people who you know working class people doing stuff. That's super legit. It was more. Uh, it was just more. It was very interesting to me that like people need a certificate for their leadership training from the army. Like motherfucker, I was a leader in the army. Like what yeah, more proof do you need that I can do right these now, things? Right now, when you like want to go to ABS, you don't have anything to show. Yeah, right, exactly. You can only yeah, say yeah. it, but uh, yeah. when you get like a diploma or anything, like you can, and also which like reflects how you did it, how you went as a leader, like mm -hmm. how you did it, then I think that it would give uh, like a lot. 
anybody who wants to be a future leader. Practically, I agree with you. From an academic, like from an idealist standpoint, I'm like, they should just recognize this. Like, why do you got some little fag who just came straight out of high school? Oh, I'm going to go to APS. Like, because daddy's paying. Or you've got a guy who got actual training, you know, in a real military organization. Yeah, I'm but like, you have to think like ABS actually, not only ABS, but when you go to school and want to learn leadership, mm -hmm. you're going there to learn leadership. But I think if you have some sort of a base, right? Because like coming back, you're... You want to do, make people do something they don't want to do. And if the diploma says that you can do it, mm. I think that gives like a good like point. Okay. I do see it that, okay, just to highlight it, just to show that you've got this. Okay. There is a diploma there. All yeah. Right. And also, uh, when you get to be a sergeant, right? You get, uh, because every month you don't get paid, but you get like uh, helping money, I would just say some allowance or something like that basically yeah, yeah. like uh, when you're when you're not a sergeant you get 100 euros and when you're a sergeant you get 135 right and that's why i recommend it too <laughs> <laughs> it actually comes in hand right there plus 75 euros yeah okay i guess for me i'm interested in that one because uh this topic i was interested in and i thought about it because in Comedy Estonia, on our admin team, our project manager is Henrik. And Henrik... Yeah, has I know he worked in the army. In the, yeah. Not in the army, but in the was Air Force. Yeah, yeah, see. Okay, so I clearly haven't. <laughs> I don't know, the military one. Yeah, okay, so I didn't look in. But I know that he had beyond uh, the mandatory thing. I know that he had leadership experience yeah. in the army. And I was super interested in that. I was like, cool. And now I know, look, Henrik has an up and down view of the army as maybe many people do who obviously if you're not there, there's some reason why you left. He still has a respect for it. I understand that. And I was extremely interested in that. Like, okay, this dude's got some foundation in leadership. We can work with this right on. Yeah, I actually... I don't know when, but in some time I started talking about it and then it, like, I was like, where are you at in the Air Force? <laughs> and people who work in the infantry <laughs> mm -hmm. were like, fucking faggots. <laughs> <laughs> Air Force flyboys. You and your fucking planes, right? Like. <laughs> and there's also like, uh, uh, all branches have like uh, something against each other, yeah. but it's like fun. Sure. Because when like a civilian comes like, oh, you fucking Air Force, eh? <laughs> fuck you. Then we're like, the fuck you want? But if you're like uh, in uh, the infantry and you're like, you see a guy with, who works in the Navy and you're like, oh, you and your fucking boats. <laughs> yeah. I work in the forest, yeah? <laughs> of course, because you can't have like, if you're anyone in the military, you can't, you're not taking shit from a civilian. Yeah. Fuck you, you're not doing the military job, you're serving your country, but if you guys are all in the military, all in the services, like, yeah, fair enough, that's part of the game. Yeah, because, like, um, so today also we had, like, a lecture about, like, uh, mm, like disagreements, right? Okay. And we were like, there are two squads, uh, squad one and squad two. Do you actually think that they won't start to compete each other, right? And we were like, no, it's good, because it helps, right? Uh, it helps to become better, right? Squad 2, they better fuck, we need to change this, change this, and then we will be better. As long as it's not like, let's kill Hendrik. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing too good of a job, right? I mean, as, as long as like, how to say that you're not losing, you're not the competitiveness, uh, how to say, is not stopping you guys from executing the mission. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we all have we all have like a goal. Yeah, we want to achieve it, but we also want to be like the better side mm. like who achieves it. Like, yeah, you did it too, but we did a better way. Right. It must be an interesting balance in the armed forces because there it, it's natural. You wear on this side, you're on that side. There's some friendly rivalry. There is still respect between the branches of the services, and you know, wear on that team, you're on that team, but. The armed, as much as I have understood, the military is most effective when all of those branches can work together and play together and respect each other. Yeah, um, 
we uh, all, yesterday got, <laughs> let me tell you I've been to the ac- academia for two weeks and like um, it's so good man yesterday this is in Bodo where you're studying right Bodo, now yes. in Bodo where you're and studying and we had a talk about uh, like the, how a squad operates at first it's a semblance like you come together everybody's like and, and what uh, shows that it's a semblance is like when you ask a question as a leader and nobody fucking answers hmm. Like you're all start starting to get a, uh, get to know each other and stuff like that. And the next step is like um, disagreements. And there's like you ask a question, and like one of the guys is like, the fuck do I have to answer that? Like who the fuck are you? So it goes like this, right? Uh, okay. Assemblance, disagreement, disagreements, and the next step is like when you're starting to accept. It's like, okay, let's do it. And the fourth step, the last one, is like you're starting to work each other, work together. Mm. You agree what your role is. Yeah, if somebody's leader, uh, he's the leader. You do your job. He's the, he the, he does your uh, his job, mm, and only then it starts it starts to work. But I think that the problem with that is when you get to the fourth point and you're doing things good for like uh, six months straight, uh, everything's perfect. Then you're like, got this. Mm. And then it's like uh, it could be a problem because you're like, doing stuff lousy or something like that. And that I do think uh, maybe become a problem if you think that you're so good you have to you don't have to like work for it. Okay, complacency kicks in. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay, if you do that. So let's back up and just explain that situation. So in Vuru, you're studying as you explained to me. You're studying at the school, the military school in Vuru, and you're what we essentially in English non commissioned officer. Yeah, is uh, why you're something like that. I, again, I don't understand all the military terms particularly myself. Uh, I do, but I don't understand them in English <laughs> <laughs> because an officer uh, they study for three years, right? right. And they study in Tartu. Uh, as I see it, and people may disagree with me, is that they make the, the calls, right? Mm-hmm. They tell that this has to be done, this has to be done, mm-hmm. and you, as a commissioned, have to like. Uh, you have to make everything sure uh, that uh, it happens. But the thing with it is that uh, the officer who gave the order, he's responsible, right? So if I fuck up, the uh, his boss is starting to look at them, mm-hmm. right? So I'm uh, starting to be uh, commissioned, uh, which is like uh, it lasts 11 months. And uh, officers uh, starting to last for three years. Okay, so to like break it down for like people in the real world and to make a comparison to a real world organization, your role is something like an operating officer. You are making it work with the, the team and you're like, okay, here's how we implement, here's the plan and here's how we're going to implement the plan. And it's very... Or on a tactical, t- operational level. Two kind of uh, two kinds of officers. Uh, one is like uh, in uh, Estonian we call it uh, mission-based operating, right? Okay. Uh, he tells you the mission when it needs to be done, and uh, you n- make sure it's done. And you, uh, he gives you the resources, and you like make it happen with the, the resources in that time. Uh, and there's this like uh, planning pace. Uh, command c- command ship, right? And uh, it's like uh, he plans everything for you. At this moment, you do this, 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 and he wants to like control everything. Are these wait? Are these two styles? So this is what we're so wait wait. We're trying to explain it for the people here. Yeah. So yeah, you make it happen. You're the operations person. Now above you, or I guess above you, there is an officer. Yes, and right? I answer directly to him. Directly to the officer. Now, these two types of officer that you are just talking about, are they? These are not like official things. This is just styles of being an officer. Yeah, they're not like you can't categorize them. No, no this is styles. That this yes, is styles, different ways yeah. that an officer could give that. One is that they could say. Uh, here's the commander's intent. Here's what I need you to do. Here are your broad boundaries that I, you can work in between. Do whatever you need to do in the middle of those boundaries to get the job done. There's another type of officer that says, here is my much more detailed plan. I need you to do this, then this, and then this, 
and yes. they're giving you much more concrete steps. Basically, yeah. Do you? Is there a place for both of those styles? Because I would think you want more of the first. You want more of the here's my intent because that's more decentralized command. That's more giving responsibility so that you can focus on the tactical, on the operation, on the date, on the whatever the date of the moment, yeah. the moment, and then the officer is up there looking out, up and out with the big vision. It depends, right? Because when you're an officer and you want uh, somebody to do something and you want to be the first type of officer, right? You sell the thing and the time and you give them the resources and they have to do it, you tell them to do it. You have to have trust that he can do it. Absolutely. He knows okay. to do it. And yeah. the other one's like, uh, I don't know him that well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell him which step, uh, step to take at what moment. And then I'm sure that it uh, like gets done. Mm -hmm. And like it all, uh, there's no right or wrong, right? It all depends on the situation. Like uh, <laughs> also yesterday we had like, um, there are three types, uh, three, uh, types of problems. One is critical critical and mm -hmm. it's like you have to do it now one is every daily it's like you know the printer's not working you know how to <laughs> fix it and the one is like complicated it and it's mm -hmm. like uh, pension or something like that like there is no right or wrong answer okay and uh, you have to uh, there's a, st a certain type of leadership qualities that work for every one of them like if you have uh, have a critical situation like i don't know the uh, buildings on fire mm -hmm and you get people that don't know anything how to do or what to do, but you have to make it happen with them. Then you give like step-by-step -step inspiration, like what to do, but you give it fast, right? But uh, when they've like dealt with this, then you're like, do it now mm -hmm. and make it happen. And when it's done, tell me, right? But it, there's also a third type of leadership, leadership and that's like uh, personal-based. Uh, I um, I think that it's like not like um, a qua it's a quality, but it's like like, like not like a type. It's like at the third. It's like uh, how do I say it? Human based. It's like you know your uh, who work for you. You know what they can do, what they can't do, and you talk to them. And that's like the third uh, type of leadership. And that's the one that I didn't get like that well. Okay. I would, um, and what it's very interesting for me to have this conversation because the whole backup, and I guess listeners of the podcast will know that uh, I'm the super into the study of leadership. And I think that it's turned around Comedy Estonia as a business and as a group of artists and that, by applying these lessons that I've learned through my own study about how to lead people, we've gone onwards and upwards. And that's not to say like I'm a fucking genius. It's like helping the people do the right things. Yeah, have right? you seen Breaking Bad? No, I haven't. No. Okay, there's like um, Jesse and Walter, and like right from the start, they were like everything is fifty fifty. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, that was like you fucked up. It doesn't work like that because when you're half and half. Uh, you say something, the other one's like, I don't know. But if you have a leader, like, uh, people are arguing, and if you're a leader, you say, no, 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 this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And they have to listen to you, and that works. And even if it doesn't, it's uh, much less complicated, you know, because you made a choice. If it doesn't work, you can learn from that. If it mm -hmm. works, hooray for you, right? Well, there, okay, so there's a lesson that in some form you need leadership. Now, there's a whole bunch to unpack in all of what you just said there. Now, one is though, the implication with what you just said is that leadership is telling someone what to do and they have to fucking do it, which you know already is not the way things work. That's not how you get people. If you tell people to do something, they may do it once, they may do it twice, but as soon as you're not watching, they're not going to do it again because that's like enforced discipline, enforced 
leadership. But uh, to wind back to what you were saying before, like the styles of leadership, and you said that there's one style where you know they're going to tell you everything to do at every step of the way. That might be known in the business world as micromanaging. That you know, he, oh, they're a micromanager. They tell me everything, and I find that when I read business books and and, and stuff like that, they're like micromanaging is bad. You don't want to micromanage people. You know, you want to better. And that's a true statement. That's where you want to get to. You don't want to be that the people under you have to ask you every single thing. Okay, we got to make this happen. Okay, boss, but now what? And now what? That's not what you want. You want them to, I think, give them your intent, give them the broad parameters, and then they know what they can work with, and then they go make it happen. If there's an extra thing, they might come back to you. Now, that's not to say I think that micromanagement is never needed. I found it. I found it. I found that micromanagement is needed when someone is new to the position, when they don't know. So your example of the fire, right? Now, if you haven't drilled that, if you haven't, okay, guys, we've done fire drills. If you haven't rung the bell at 3 a.m. and you know 15 times, and they, you know, then yes, it's like you know what to do. But if they've never done a fire drill before then yeah, you're going to have to tell them. This is when it comes in, like when you're micro micromanaging it, then you don't trust them at first. right? Correct. No, at first. Yeah. But then the idea, I think when you micromanage somebody, you need as the leader to be extremely mindful to be backing off bit by bit with that micromanagement because you're going to be like, on them with the list of their projects or whatever. Like, are you on that? Are you on that? And then every status mean they're like, yeah, boss, I'm on that. Yeah, boss, I'm on that. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. And then you back off. So to me, micromanagement is always a temporary, ideally a temporary phase as someone's getting into it because it's not a sustainable thing to do. Yeah, do believe it. In the army, we have to like... Uh one thing is uh, micro management, right? But mm -hmm. the other thing is having control. Okay. You don't have to micro manage everything if you control it. And it depends if you're controlling the whole thing that did this uh, mission mm -hmm. like was done. Did they get it right? Or you want to see if everything during the mission was uh, done right also. Like we... Uh, Yes, sir. We have the fo formula. You can do the right thing right. You, do, you can do the right thing wrong. You can do the wrong thing right. And you can also do the wrong thing wrong, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. And, uh, well, I think every company and uh, you know, everything also like should be involving to is doing the right thing right. Okay, yeah. But if, you, if you're doing the right thing wrong, it's okay. You can say it that like you're doing this wrong, right? If you're doing the wrong thing right... You can say it like you're doing a good job, but this isn't what you're supposed to do. If you're mm -hmm. doing the wrong thing wrong, you just have a serious talk about right, it. Right, it's all fucked. Yeah, yeah. that's the age, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Sure. So is there some goal? Has there been set uh, Because I think every like uh, company needs to have like a goal. Like mm -hmm. a right uh, maybe not like like a big like we're only doing this for the rest of our likes, mm. lives, uh, but uh, like for the week, right? Yeah. Like at Friday, we need to have, I don't know, like for instance, Comet kind of Estonia, like 10,000 tickets sold, or like we need to have this venue, these venues in on our rounds. And uh, I think that you, uh, as a leader, you should, um, like, if you're like pro project based man uh, managing, you're telling like, and to be to do that, we need to do this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. But uh, mission-based management is like, you're only saying that we need to do this by that uh, time. And uh, these are the resources that we have. Mm -hmm. These, uh, one of them like, doesn't, isn't micromanagement. It's still like management, right? You're doing people what they need to do to make this done. Mm. But if you do it like, Ten, nine weeks for straight, then it's like you need to do this. Have you done it? Yes, good, do it. 
Oh, sure, that makes sense. So you back off eventually, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. when you, you I see think that, that they've got it. To make it to like, yeah. to get it, like start uh, taking away from it. But I see your point though, that organizations, any organization needs... Okay, so like I, I made the comment about commander's intent, which is what generally what am I trying to, you know, I, this is what I need you to do and I need you and there may That's be... That's actually a big one, sorry, mm -hmm. in the army too, because um, mm. when we have like this... Uh, mission uh, the battalion's commander tells the mission to the company's commander the company's commander tells the mission to the uh, squad's commander and also he tells him the battalion's commander's mission right so that the squad leader like uh, knows what purpose he's serving right what well, his part in the bigger picture yeah, is yeah. so he understands where yeah, he fits so in the if greater he makes thing the decision he's like does this uh, serve the bigger picture right so, uh, so yeah, I think like actually the defense forces makes I don't know in the real world too a lot of sense, right? Tremendous! Oh, bro, I am all about the idea that the training that you guys get in the military is a hundred percent relevant. It is. It's one and the same. A hundred percent relevant to real life, to businesses about because it's not about. Because people think that the military, as much like, again, is all like, do you fucking do that? You do it or I'll put you in the brig. You know, it's that's not leadership. It's the same in the military but and in I, companies. I would, uh, yesterday, uh, our lecturer made a point mm -hmm. that leadership anywhere is the same, except when you're in the army or the defense forces, mm -hmm. you have to consider that you may get some people killed, right? Interesting. Okay. And, Absolutely. Fair point. And you have to... Uh, Actually, he said it like this. You have to understand that your end goal in the war is to kill people. But you have to take a consideration like your people are also getting killed. Yeah. And I, for me, that's like a big difference, right? Okay. I, no, that is a very fair point. But yeah, mm. I do think like this whole uh, leadership uh, classes and all that, that's like really interesting. Although... We wake up like at six thirty, and like by by lunch, I'm like trying to stay up. So, what is your? So, right now you're studying, yeah. right? So that you, it's more of a study, like you you're doing classes, yeah. you've got assignments to do, and 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 essays or whatever to write. So, but when I don't know what what was the last active kind of you know getting up at six a.m. doing your soldier thing what was the last time you were doing that what was your day like i'm trying to like, that's what i'm trying to get to what's cool or like when i don't know i mean right now are you living on a base right now uh yes oh, okay so what's your what's your regular day like right now uh, i wake up at 6 30 or 6 40 it depends if i press snooze or not <laughs> and uh, then i we have to do like one run and do like some exercises to wake up like in the body right hmm. then we do our hygiene eat stuff like that and then we have our homie chris i don't know how to say it we line people up and check that everybody's okay we look okay we don't have like uh, three inch oh. nails is that like happening that. and i think people probably have only seen this in the movies is that where are you actually doing this like in your bunk room or lining up no, with like in a, the outside oh in the outside you're all lining yeah, okay yeah. yeah okay in the bunk room it's actually in the end of night if you want ah, to go out. okay <laughs> so, so you gotta go out so you do your morning exercise you get some food and then it's morning inspection out yeah, on the parade ground yeah. yeah okay yeah and it's all when we're studying it's almost the same uh, as mandatory service because our uh, leaders right now they think that exercise when you're in the army is like vital you have to do it right yeah sounds reasonable and you have to do it in the morning too because mm -hmm. it wakes you up stuff like that you get your pulse ring stuff like that also yeah and uh, I, I think that's a fair point not everybody agrees with me because some people don't sleep at the campus right or at the camp mm -hmm. and they have to wake up like at four to get there and stuff like that but in the mandatory service, uh, you're staying there from uh, Monday to Friday, most of the time, right? Mm. And you don't have any to be anywhere to be. So at 10 o'clock, uh, you go to sleep. You have to go to sleep. And at 6 o'clock, you wake up and start your uh, routine then. How long is the exercise routine in the morning? It's like half an hour. Right? Oh, all right. We run for like five minutes and then it's like, I don't know, we do all kinds of stuff. And mm -hmm. 
usually we do like I don't know 20 25 push ups and that's it it's not hard you know I was going to say five yeah okay it doesn't sound like a it, super intense yeah, routine yeah, no, because it's not uh, <laughs> actually in the like 20 years ago it was like you were screamed at you have to mm. wake up you go outside you start running and you wake up when you're in the middle of running right <laughs> because you have to be outside like yeah. in two minutes yeah and everybody's like puking everywhere but that's not the end goal right yeah the goal is to catch you up get your system like running you know it's like basically like starting a car in the winter yeah you, sure you like turn it on and you like wait a couple of minutes to the engine like uh, it's interesting running. to know because i think many people would still have a view and probably myself like that it's it's like it's full metal jacket it's ali army liad army you know you piece of shit you get up there like just yelling and a drill sergeant doing that and uh well, things are not quite like the movies. It's a good thought. point, and <laughs> sometimes you have to do it, right? All right, yeah. Because uh, I think I heard it somewhere, uh, or I actually read it in a book. No, I heard it, yeah. <laughs> you, uh, when you're in battle, right, you remember the hardest part of your training. Okay. Uh, so, like, when you're getting screamed at, you're tired and th- stuff, you thought about your training and you're mm-hmm. like it's way more charging in training like I can get through this and that that mentality helps and also there's a side like in the US Army right you have the drill sergeants mm. but they don't go to war so the dumb uh, not dumb like the ones who seem cunts to you you wouldn't want to go to war with them mm. in the US Army they're only there to like be cunts right but they're not going to the army. I think it's uh, the same in the uh, Estonian uh, army. You have, uh, you know, very really unlikable uh, <laughs> leaders. <laughs> and uh, they're good for uh, training. Mm. They get shit done. But at the end of the day, you don't want to go to the war with them. Mm. You, wanted to go, you want to go to the war with a leader who... Uh, respects you, trusts you, you trust him, and, you know, you're like a brother, mm-hmm. like maybe a father or a son or something like that's but... A leader, you can do, I mean, leader, yeah, I think, leader, works yeah, there. Yeah, leader. leader works there. But not a guy who's like, piece of shit, motherfucker, like, yeah. run faster. But then even then, I wonder, okay, let, let's take, uh, there is, a, I, I think, a real nugget in truth of what you said, that you're trained, you need to, whatever you do, you need to train so hard that when the real thing comes, and that is either a war or that is in a business setting that you've, you've I don't know what that might be, like that when you come to the real thing that you need to do, that you're like, hey, no factor, I know how to do this because I trained so hard. Then the th- I guess the question is in the military, what's the most effective way to train hard? Is there, you know, is having this dude yell the fuck at me and call me every name under the sun, this is hard. I agree. Are there more effective forms of hard training than just uh, that? It depends. It's, is it hard for your brain or like mentality or physically? Like we hmm. have this, uh, things called drills. It's like uh, you need to like change your magazine and you do it one time. Okay, again second time and you do it like literally 500 times right mm. and by five o'clock you just say do and they all have a, already had the like magazine makes changed. sense that's what you want yeah but uh, that's the quality of a soldier right yeah they can do their shit really good mm-hmm. but uh, for leaders we have uh, this thing in Galavi Infantry Battalion uh, called the st- stress night oh my <laughs> fig- favorite time what does it year. tell me uh, it's uh, to year when <laughs> I get to leave myself out at people who don't want to be there. <laughs> so we wake them up at like 10.30 and they're thinking like I'm right. asleep, nothing's going to happen. Right? And last year, like we blowed uh, fucking smoke all over the floor. We had like <laughs> strobo lights, right? <laughs> <laughs> We had like everybody yelling at Sam. They were like running in the fucking uh, (laughs) army room with the boxers on. And they were like literally crying. And uh, it happened to me too. And I can honestly say it was the best night of my life. (laughs) It was so fucking fun because (laughs) 
you do this uh, you do this hard stuff right the we had this uh leader uh, yell at us like give up you're not gonna do it give up mm. and you were like i'm gonna do it no give up i'm gonna do it <laughs> and we did it and we had like a uh, formation and he told now this shit is over go back to bed <laughs> two seconds later <laughs> Fuck off, it's just beginning, right? <laughs> and like we uh, marched for like eight kilometers with like uh, big pieces of wood mm. on our uh, shoulders. And when it all uh, finished, we were like uh, up 14 hours. It doesn't seem like much, but we were like exercising, running. Yeah, non-stop. We were all like weapons and stuff like that. And after that, we played games. When somebody said like you're the leader now what you're gonna do hmm. and everybody looked at how you acted as a leader hmm. to see how you worked in a stressed in, uh, environment how you worked uh, when you hadn't had any sleep and stuff like that and i think that like uh, works mm. when you're uh, training to be a leader so Fuck you're, yeah yeah you're, you're putting like because we did there like stuff that wouldn't happen to you like in any battle, like we were, uh, how to say, crouching, like babies do. Crawling. Crawling in a water, like, I don't know, one uh, meter. We were crawling, and then our, my leader, like, looked at me. Lower. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna drown. I know, lower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and my, like, Backpack was the only thing that was above the bar and was like holding me, huh. and I I loved it. You know, I, it was fun for me because of like I'm like uh, it's a problem that actually at work too. Like I think I take serious stuff not seriously. I get the goal; it's serious. I, I do it, but I'm like joking around, doing it, having fun, and stuff like that. And it may be like uh, a problem at some point. But yeah, but I I do enjoy it. Yeah. It may may be a problem at some point, but if you can learn to balance that off, yeah, like okay, fair enough. There are going to be moments where, especially as a leader, I'm going to have to be guys. Okay, this is yeah. But uh, thing is, uh, that's the thing I'm learning right mm. right now. It, uh, when it's to time to like crack a joke or something like because what I learned is like cracking a joke at some some moments is like helping you to motivate the guys right yeah helping to them to be better i think it's because what you do in that moment is you show them you're a human being too like you've got to balance off the amount of emotion i hear i'm telling you shit like what do i know right but um it's a podcast so we're all experts here that i think that you've got to balance off the emotion that you show and when you regulate that and yeah like as a leader, yes, I am detached. Yes, I'm going to ask my troops to do really hard things. You may have to go do a potentially life-threatening thing. And that does, I would imagine, involve some level of detachment. You're there and you're like, hey, man, you got to go storm that thing. And there's going to be bullets and stuff and, you know, that. And so that's obviously serious. But you, on the other hand, there is some moments you can't be a complete robot. Yeah, yeah. Either. You've got to show your people I'm a real human being with emotions too. And they go, okay, I'm going to follow this guy because I get he's a real human. And that's what I think you're doing in those moments. Yeah, that's uh, a great point was made in class. Also that uh, when you're a leader, the guys trust you. And one po- part of the trust is that uh, you trust them and also they trust you. Mm. If you're all the time like... Uh, a robot and do this, do that, it doesn't do it again. Yeah. They don't trust you, like, because they think that you're some kind of robot, right? Mm-hmm. And also going back to the stress night, uh, there's three types of people, right? One of them, they get it done, they do it right, they seem to have some qualities of a leader. Uh, the second type is they don't give a fuck, they just want to done and go to sleep and the third part is i've seen it uh, a few times it's not like like a maturity but like every year there's like a two three uh, two years ago right something and they are full-on crying hmm. like starting to cry 
one time like a guy told me he'll call his mother and get him in the battalion <laughs> actually my thought was like good luck with that you you do know we have armed security guys <laughs> and like but i know it sounds harsh but then we can like pick out your you can't do it mm. sorry but you can but we don't have enough time to teach you how to do it right I mean, that's a fair point. I mean, we're not trying to be like, you're a pussy, fuck off. But it's like, that's what you're there. You're there to be tested yeah, yeah. under the most extreme circumstances. Yeah, so but when you're called upon, you can do it. Yeah, but they don't get it, right? Because I I had him, like, he was crying out, though, like, that's the point. We, we want to see you, how you're working in a stress in, uh, environment. And he was like, no, fuck you. You told me that I couldn't get my shoes on in the dark, and then uh, you yelled at me, yelled at me even louder. And uh, yeah, mm. that's a, that's the whole point. Eh? But not everyone uh, gets it, and I get it, right? They don't have to. Actually, no, they don't have to get it because uh, everybody's different who comes, right? One of them is like a full patriot, works uh, had like quite elite everything behind them, and comes there. Yeah, that's gonna do it. And the other one's like sad and why the fuck I gotta be here, right? Mm. And that's like, I don't know. You have to like have uh, different uh, kind of approaches every time at different people. And at the end of the day, it it drives you out, man. It makes you fucking sleepy. And those those people that have that reaction, again, we're not... Because like, first of all, I'm not even the military, so I can't, you know, they've even got further than I have. So I'm not here to like criticize that person. But it's more like when you're put under stress, humans react in a very emotional, illogical ways. And that person can be like a very switched on good person, right? But then they're put into a stressful situation. Actually, the uh, guy I'm talking about, he was like, he was a really nice guy. Hmm. The next day he actually gave him like, I overreacted, but right. can I do this for you? And I was like, yeah, you can, but now I know that he can do the mm. job, but not if there's like a big stress factor sure. out there. And I get why people don't want to have it in the military, but I also think that it is one of the best ways to uh, like uh, uh, understand if a people is like uh, also good in a stress environment because the stress environment doesn't only come in war. It also comes like, in training, you're in the uh, forest trying to do your stuff, and then uh, your like uh, leader is talking to you on the radio, like get it done, get it done, get it done. And when you get it like ten times, it's a stress factor, right? Mm. And if the guy heard you like act out there, like fuck you, I'm gonna call my mother, right? Then it's like fucked because he's the leader, and all the seven guys behind her, mm. be- behind him, are gonna look at uh, him like the fuck do we do now right but can it be i mean l- let's say someone has that reaction and again we understand that's an emotional reaction some people have that that's just how some people deal with stress and the next day that gentleman had some logical assessment that okay he could look and detach a little bit and go okay i see that's reacted is there sort of like there is and it, maybe that person is i don't know a good person maybe they still have elements of being a good soldier in them they still have technical skills that yeah, they can offer is that mean there could I be another in because he can be a good soldier mm-hmm. but not a good leader okay all right right on but does that mean yeah like it's like okay here's there's still a role that this person can play in the army yeah of course mm. because uh, Leaders have the most stress, right? Because uh, everybody accepts, uh, uh, accepts, everyone wants answer from them. And when you're a soldier, you get told what to do. Of course, there's stress like no sleep or something like that. But your job is to be behind the gun and shoot at the right place and be awake at the right time, right? Actually, there's like a lot more stuff, but, <laughs> but uh, nobody wants like any specific answer from you. Mm. So, yeah, I think um, that's actually a good point. I was once told that no matter what you do, how fucking bad you are at anything, you always have a place in the army. (laughs) 
and like peeling potatoes. <laughs> yeah, we, need, we, need, we need those people. Someone's right? got to peel potatoes, right? Someone's yeah, got to drive but, the truck. Someone's got to, you know. The thing is, we don't need people pe- peeling our potatoes when it's war, right? Yeah. So there's a uh, peace time. Yes, we need you. War time. I don't know what we're f- fucking going to do with you. Mm. Right. How is, um, I don't know if you have a true perspective of this. Like, how is it to train when, like, right now is peacetime? Yeah. You know, there isn't a direct thing. Yeah. There is some, I, I don't know, are we still doing missions? Uh, yeah. To, to, so there's some missions. So there is some, some yeah. level of active service. Is that, uh, you'd call that active service that's happening uh, in the no uh, i'm at active service right you're not but like i am you be- are right yeah because it's like uh, i'm working here daily for okay. the rest of my life or yeah but uh it's we have in estonia a scouts battalion hmm. and that's the estonian only uh, professional battalion that's where every private or you know soldier too is a active uh, person in the military right mm-hmm. they work there they're not the mandatory, but they work there as their job is to be like the guy behind the weapon and shoot where you have to shoot. And they go to the mission. Okay. Because <laughs> we're never sending uh, the mandatory service into, I don't know, Afghanistan or stuff. Yeah, like that. sure. I went to, I mean, I was there in Afghanistan. Uh, they sent me and Stuart and uh, another guy, Andy Valvo, and we did the comedy shows in Afghanistan. I mean, this was six, seven years ago, a really long time ago now. And, uh, you know, it was a very, extremely illuminating and I realized what a fucking pussy I am. Uh, you know, being out there and I, I gained a lot of respect um, for the military and I learned a lot of things on the inside. But how is it to train when, like, there isn't war? Not at least for Estonia right now. And you've got to train thinking there is. You've got to what, simulate those circumstances or how do you get around that? How do you, how do you train people when it's not war right now? No, uh, the pragmatic response is we use each other as opponents, right? Okay. Like the you go there, and when they cross this line, shoot them. But uh, when you're working in an inf- in, uh, infantry battalion like Kalev or uh, Scouts, you don't do the city stuff, right? You don't go blowing up cities. You're only working in the forest, right? Mm. So you can uh, you try to teach them like when the opponents there like uh, half of the team is uh, like this I mean straightforward to them and the other one uh, goes around and starts shooting like that right yep. okay, so then you have like this some regular tank okay so we're flanking one's yeah, coming flanking, in there yeah. flanking yeah but uh, the uh, cities like we don't do like uh, city war hmm. uh because I think that's for the uh, guide city. Do you know what it is? That's the voluntary service, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, voluntary. Yeah. You're in there for the rest of your life. You have a weapon at home or something like right, that. Yeah. And, and you're like, that's for like uh, Ozolots or like uh, in city, city, cities. But yeah, how we, I actually think about it a lot of time because I made a point earlier where I said that uh, modern war isn't like three fucking battalions are just marching at each other like mm. lift lift it's like well that that ended with the british where because the british used to wear big red bright fucking uniforms and just march with muskets yeah yeah so we haven't had that form of war for some time let's say at least not world war one well might have been the last time we had such yeah. a war of attrition yeah I, actually yeah, i learned history history in high school and that was like i don't remember I don't remember it's British, but uh, we uh, first of all there was like uh, trenches, trenches, yeah. yeah. And they were like all like dirt over them. And they were like big fucking flowers sticking out, <laughs> right? But in Estonia, I asked this a lot about my, uh, about a lot. Like uh, the war isn't like what it used to be, right? Mm. Because it's guerrilla. You get like the troop, uh, two persons shooting up there, there, there. And you may actually never see the opponent. Hmm. You only get shot. That's like the Afga- Afghanistan example or some Middle East. Insurgents is what you might be fighting in the urban streets or, yeah. or, or something. But like also that. looking at the <coughs> Russia, uh, you n- 
like looking at uh, Russia's uh, previous battles, their tactics is like at first they're gonna shoot a lot of uh, artillery, and then the uh, infantry comes in, mm -hmm. and that's why we teach soldiers that you have to dig a hole, <laughs> stay in there, and shoot. Okay. Because uh, in Sinim, I guess I don't know. It was a place in Nidaviruma. It was like uh, Estonia's dug holes. The Russian shot, Russian shot artillery, artillery. The Estonians were at hole. The artillery was all gone, right? The soldiers stand up and like, <laughs> all <laughs> and they went. So the artillery. Okay, so this this is interesting. So the artillery is coming from tanks or from portable artillery or mortars or what? When you say artillery. Uh, it's tanks is not artillery. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah, but that's good. I don't understand all the terms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, artillery, I mean, like um, artillery comes in all kinds of ways, but I mean by artillery is like this: that uh, you're at a line, mm -hmm. and somebody is uh, shooting behind you, in front of you, like at the op opponent. Okay. And like I mean, like they have uh, this tank kind of vehicles. That heavy, have, heavy stuff. Yeah, yeah. They had like those mortars, like the mm. I don't know, Taliban has, uh, and all kinds of stuff. They have like this fucking uh, cannons. Uh, Estonia has them too, right? But uh, Russia has like much, much more. Sure. And Russia, like, uh, they uh, create so much fucking ammo. Uh, it's unfucking real. They don't give a fuck about ammo. Mm. Like, because Estonia doesn't uh, create ammo, right? We uh, ordered from like Brazil or something like that. But Russia, it's all done there. They like just say they want more and they get more, right? And that's like I think uh, could be a problem. But the reason I ask all about this is because as a civilian, when I read the news, and that's obviously just the civilian level of propaganda that we hear. All the time, all I'm hearing about is, yeah, guess what? We bought some more javelins. And as much as I've understood, the javelins are all about taking out tanks oh, or yeah, some sort of them. heavy, you know, something super heavy that's coming at you, right? A tank or something similarly as large. So the impression that I always got, well, I'm like, well, if they're buying all these javelins, doesn't that mean they're expecting a whole bunch of tanks to yeah, come but, over uh, the border? What I meant by that, that uh, the first artillery and then infantry... Uh, Russian uh, ground force look like um, they have a tank or a, a vehicle, armored vehicle, mm -hmm. and the guys are like coming uh, between them. So, like, tank okay. guys, tank guys. And when you, because the tanks, uh, they are like shooting real stuff, like, you know, like big fucking uh, grenades and stuff like that. Um, when you get, in, uh, get rid of that, when you're a soldier, you see like, Oh fuck! My tank just blew up, right? Mm. And that I think works with you. Very demoralizing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. These fucking forest brothers over here—they just took out my tank. Oh shit! Okay, this yeah, is a but run, Sergey. Run. Javelins, right? I don't. I think they like costs over one hundred thousand euros, and they're like so fucking good to watch. Yeah. There's how like, much like for the weapon? How much per round? I meant the round. Oh, per round. Yeah, yeah. Damn. Uh, no, I, I meant like I don't want to be wrong at this, but sure, one hundred thousand okay, you know. minimum. Yeah. I think it was like three hundred thirty k, something like that. Huh. But the weapon is so fucking cool. You like shoot it, and you see like an um, a thermal camera, okay. and you can sh see the fucking object you're shooting at. And you shoot it, and you can see the uh, missile going down, falling, and. Pew, Going up, and like five seconds later, you're like, "Is that what it does?" I, I so I know nothing about it. So yeah, it the uh, well. like uh, gets it from above. So it goes. So okay. So you. So old mate Estonian. Uh, his his seam. He's doing it for the country. He's defending Tallinn against the invaders. He's got his javelin, and there's some sort of little screen or something yeah, yeah. Or so on the javelin, and he puts the the tank in the sights. And it, from what you just told me, it travels along, but no, then it goes... It, it goes like... Uh, he shoots it parallel to the ground or upwards? I'm parallel, but Par at first... Uh, <laughs> the javelin, like, at first it's like, I don't know, taking shit, like... 
can't. So then it goes upwards. So it yeah, fly, yeah. it goes kind of down a little bit, whatever. But then the missile yeah, goes up because you have to take in consider it's made for destroy tanks, right? Yeah. And uh, when you're shooting in front of the tra- tank, it does nothing because it's uh, in front of the tank. It's uh, like much more armor. Uh, the heaviest but armor is at the front. On right. top, it's like nothing. Ah, so the the javelin then I would assume is so clever that it knows the distance away that the object is because it knows how it, at some stage is yeah, going to go up and you're down. Locking on it, on it. Yeah. javelin uh, in the army we call it uh, shoot and forget. Okay, yeah. we have three kinds of uh, mm-hmm. anti tank uh, weapons. The first is Karl Gustav. Fucking hate it, right? It's a big fucking cylinder uh-huh. made of metal it weighs like 20 kilograms and you have to like reload it so it sounds like like a classic it's like rpg that yeah, people yeah. might know from the movies yeah. or, or fucking call of duty the or bazooka, something right yeah, yeah. yeah bazooka yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you have to like you have to like you see it i think it's 300 meters away and then you're like right <laughs> take it like a bit higher uh, or like uh, uh because there's an optic, yeah. Yeah, okay, Scroll. right. So it's a bit, yeah, okay. It's a cl- straight up bazooka as people might think of it yeah. as one, yeah. And you like shoot and you have to see it if it hits. Yeah. And if it doesn't hit, there's like two meters to the left. Mm. And they're like, make corrections. And then there's uh, Milan. I don't know a lot about Milan, but I heard yeah. it's like you shoot, you aim, and when you aim it, it hits the target. Okay. But it still goes straight, you know, just straight at the thing. Yeah, as yeah. as far as I know, I've never seen Milan. But sure. Javelin is like target. Beep 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 beep. <laughs> Fuck. The Javelins, oh, they're angry, man. I guess the flip side of that would be the you said the most simplistic one, the Carl Gustav. Yeah. I mean, not very not costing three hundred K per it's weapon. Not, that would not. be the flip side, right? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, Carl Gustav I've shot it like, I don't know. 20 times, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's fucking fun, you know. You shoot it. You can see, like, uh, 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 anti-armory uh, uh, grenades. It goes, like, psh, 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 straight through it. Fucking love it. How much recoil is there? when you're? So you're holding this thing, right? Uh, Are you? Do you have to lay on the ground or you do it standing? It doesn't count because the Carl Gustav is, like, it's all hollow, right? Okay. So if the uh, grenade starts to fly out of there, mm-hmm. the all, all the recoil goes out of the oh, hole. But okay. there's a but. Mm-hmm. I sh- later show you a video because if you shoot it and one but somebody's like behind you, <laughs> they're like <laughs> <laughs> they're fucked. They're right. fucked. Yeah. All right. They're getting a tan. Okay. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> they're getting funerals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you watch a bit like some uh, ISIS guns <laughs> was like yeah. <laughs> shooting the RPG. Like, I love who? And some guy ran behind him and where the fuck good did night. that guy go? Right? It's good night for Ahmed. Yeah. <laughs> That's good night. <laughs> okay. No more kebab. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. We're an hour and a half in. We can do that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't get that far, yeah? Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. And I, and I actually, I've got it. This is one thing I definitely have stopped my doing my podcast. I always used to be like, Jesus, if you guys are two hours in, fuck and what? And I realized how disrespectful that was to anyone who does actually take the time to listen this far. Thank you very much yeah. for Thanks. listening here. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> um, it's real nice of you. Uh, okay. So, right. Um... So, yeah, so, yeah, my whole, so getting back to the, the javelins thing, because all we hear a lot, I mean, I saw we got some new guns recently. Yeah, the Rojas. Right, okay, there was a nice uh, press event where all the press got to shoot the gun. And usually then all I hear is about it's a javelin. So that always led me to believe what we think is the Russians are coming over the border with heavy, uh, or heavy stuff, right? Heavy tanks, heavy something or other, and that's how they're going to do it. Yeah, but we have to take uh, and consider that the Russians are coming with heavy stuff. They definitely have heavy stuff, right? Mm. But uh, we're in NATO, right? That's why Estonians uh, go into active missions because we help, like the NATO, yeah. the NATO helps us, right? It's like 
don't know, it's Article 5, I think. Right, that's the big thing. Article 5. You attack one, you attack them all. Yeah, yeah. We, right now, we have in Estonia, like, the Americans, uh, mm. Brits, uh, fucking Denmark, Belgians, uh, France. We all, that, we all have that in Dapa, right? Mm. They have the heavy stuff, right? But if the Estonia doesn't have a mandatory service and spend like 2% of the GDP, why the fuck should they care, right? If hmm. we are not doing the job, right, why right, should right. they? That's so interesting for me because one of the reasons I admire you guys in the military is that like, I didn't ever have to do that shit. Like we don't have the concept of mandatory military service. We do, haven't had it for 50 years or something in Australia. Um, yeah, but Australia is a big country, right? Right. And uh, when they want an army, I mm. think that they could get it like a professional army. Like you can come work there. It's not. We, we do. Yeah, yeah. You have the army. Yeah, and we have the reserves as well. Kite's elite, you know, equivalent. Yeah, yeah. In but, there as well. Uh, in Estonia, there was actually I don't remember what island it was, but there was like seven hundred thousand people in there, in some big nation like that sacked it, and the only thing that saved them from being occupied is that they were so fast in uh, reassembling hmm. their uh, troops. Right. And that's what matters in Estonia. That's why yeah. every year we have like uh Kogunem with Kevat Torm all that. Like we are every year we're like uh, uh training for it. Yeah, we I mean it's a very different situation in Australia. So uh we've got things like one I mean things are very okay, things are different in the age of you can fire a missile from anywhere, but Going a little bit before that, I mean, the Australian army strategy was we're just going to, like, you come from the north, we're just going to fall back. Like, cool. Come through that. You know that desert with all them spiders and crocodiles and shit? Be my guest. You know, where there's no food and yeah. no water for 2,000 kilometers? Be my guest. Try to go through the middle. So their strategy was just, and those guys, uh, there's a classic Australian TV show from the 80s and it's called The Bush Tucker Man and it's a classic, every Australian knows this and he's a, he was a general in the Australian army and his whole job was to travel the Australian countryside and find out what you can eat and what you can't eat and he would have really great relations. He learnt from the local Aboriginal people and he had really great connections with all the different tribes yeah, yeah. all over the land and they made like three seasons of TV about him just travelling around and he'd be like, oh mate, look at this. This little bug, you get this little bug off the tree and he'll keep you going for another day. He's got lots of protein in him. Yeah. And they know all that shit. So one part of it is like, I bet you guys don't know how to live off this land. We know how to do that. Um, yeah, it's a huge nation. It's hard to get down. Uh, I, there was... But the only th uh, other thing with Australia is that like it doesn't hold, in my opinion, like a strategic... Yeah, uh, <laughs> it gives a shit. Yeah. Well, it's a whole <laughs> continent, right? Of its own. Yeah. Because you want to get er uh, Europe, you have to like, pick certain countries. Mm. You want to get Australia. That, that fucking Australia, who gives a fuck? Yeah. yeah you what get you like do? a whole bunch of deserts and like the Opera House, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> and most likely you'll be bit by a spider or something like that, and you'll die anyway. <laughs> But Lou, I think uh, bathroom break. Yeah, let's thing. have a bathroom break. Let's do it. Yeah. We'll take a little break later. Yeah, man. So for me, I don't know, listening to that stuff and then learning those lessons changed my world around. And I was like, oh, yeah, because for me, what I was able to do, and this, it may be more difficult if someone's a junior person or what in, what in work or the military, but when I was learning about this stuff, I was like, I could directly apply those principles. Yeah. He's like, do this. And I'm like, hey, Sander, do that. And it worked. And I was like, oh shit. Like I, cause I am in a position to lead people. So I could, when I could directly apply them, uh, that's when the, the lessons became really, they were no longer academic to me. Yeah. Let me go for it. Please. Uh, mm -hmm. First is the you, uh, leadership uh, model. Like okay. How is a good leader built? And answers questions like, what is leadership? Mm -hmm. And that's like a tricky question, right? Because uh, when you ask somebody who like runs a small business or something, mm. what is it to be a leader? And they're like, I don't know, telling people what to do. Mm. But it's not like that. Yeah, I like, like I can talk about that, yeah. Uh, we like, uh, kind of understanding it's like, 
not selling people, mm. but uh, how do you say it? Sunama. <laughs> it's like you're driving, driving people to do it. Yeah, it's not. It's not a manipulation. Because manipulation sounds like a bad word, yeah, right? M- manipulation uh, to do assumes that uh, yeah. they're doing it for you. Like yeah, you want it for them. Yeah, yeah. I, it is a manipulation, but it's like to get the mission done. Yeah. Manipulation yeah. is only manipulation if it's for my bad purposes. Yeah, yeah. But when I manipulate you to do the mission for the greater good, yeah. then that's a positive, and you're and when you're happy that you you know did yeah, that, yeah. it's. Uh, uh, like how to articulate your thoughts better okay. was the next thing. It was like both uh, in literature and mm-hmm. also speaking. That was a big from one for me because we had to like uh, write an essay, hmm. like write it, write it. And I'm good at talking, right? But I'm fucking shit at writing stuff down and mm. putting the commas in the right place and st- all stuff like that. Yeah, we can talk about that. I mean, that's an interesting one. The importance of communication of literature of writing the yeah yeah and that these skills that in the army you don't then you're not just a bunch of fucking roughnecks <laughs> uh, gorillas right like yeah. actually this intelligent you know education is very important um yeah man how to say eriala And today, like, for instance, we uh, had to talk about how to resolve conflicts okay. in the squad, right? And there was, like, all those... We... Bec- the thing is that we aren't in a lecture, we're in a discussion all the time. Mm. And the uh, teacher is all like, uh, getting a summer. I, I always... Uh, quite funny, I think it's... For me, uh, teaching and studying... Is like uh, mm. teaching and signings for me is like uh, having a baby, right? Okay. You can't do it alone. <laughs> well, you can. You can do it off of Pornhub. It's not really having a baby, though. Yeah, but you're kind of doing it. It's a halfway there, right? <laughs> sure. And uh, <laughs> if both of them are dumb cunts, the teacher and the student. <laughs> think what you're gonna have right and also if the teacher wants to have a best <laughs> if the teacher wants you to wants to teach something and you don't want to have it you're getting an abortion right but it only works if the teacher and the student both want it it happens and it also it doesn't like happen like this right you're having a baby it's like like it starts like uh, the teacher plants a seed in you. Literally, yeah. Yeah, and you're like starting to progress and uh, grow it. And that's what I think like uh, studying is. It's not like the cunt who's standing and talking, he has mm. to tell me everything, right? But you have to want it. You have to want to take in the information or the seed. <laughs> and stuff like that. <laughs> Which is the analogy for leadership as well. Which is, it's not just somebody barking orders at you. It's not just the boss telling you the things that you need to do today. It's building a relationship with that person that they understand where you're coming from. You understand them. There's mutual respect that you build up relationship capital over time. I really like that one. The idea of relationship capital, which is that you... Develop a, you build a relationship with the people in your team and you treat them well. So when the tough time comes, when, you know, when I've got to then say, hey, Sander, I got a real shit private show, but I really need you to do it, buddy, for these reasons. Here's yeah. why, you know, is this customer's important or, gee, we need this money or for this reason, this is not what you want to do. 
this is a, a valuable customer who might give us more gigs. You're building the relationship capital. So when I go to Sander and I say, buddy, I need you to do this private for me. Could you do that? He'll go, cool. Because I don't ask that very often because I build up credibility in his eyes that I'm not going to ask him. You the know, thing with this is it's uh, for me, like basically leadership is, is like um, making, uh, selling stuff and buying stuff, right? <laughs> because uh, you can't sell stuff stuff if it doesn't have any money, right? You have to offer something and want something in return, right? And that's the same in the army, army, right? Like, you offer something, hey, do this, and if he doesn't want to do it, but in return, you get this, right? So it's always like uh, making bargain or something like that, right? And it uh, works both ways because, sure, you can do it once or twice, like, you know, year, but if it comes like in uh, everything you do, it's like you're telling him or her stuff that he needs to do. Mm. It doesn't work like that. I mean, why would they? And for me, I guess I learned that lesson more um, naturally with Comedy Estonia because the difference for us is that we're not a straight up company the way that, okay, there's the boss and there's the next manager and the next manager and then there's the the frontline workers that we have the structure that yes we have an office team i got henrik i got hella i got christina in who are you know more straight up and down employees but then i also manage these comedians and these comedians are not as figuratively employees even though i may guide them lead them mentor them they're comedians, bro. If they don't want to do it, they ain't fucking doing it. They will yeah, yeah. fuck off and tell you to go jump or not do it. Like, if, for example, the, the classic example for this is me uh, that I've, I've spoken about a few times before is that people might ask, oh, with your with your comedians, with Sandra and Mika and these guys, you know, has Comedy Estonia got a contract with them? And I'm like, I don't have a contract with them. And we did originally in the beginning, like, because I didn't know nothing in the beginning. And we actually talked to our lawyer friend and we got some sort of performance contract that said, okay, you're going to do a tour. Here's the contract. You're going to do these shows. Da, 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 da. And I got the whole thing made up and yeah. I read it and I went, fuck this. And, I, and it hit me in that moment that the best way to get this comedian to do this tour is to treat them well. Yeah, but it comes down to trust right right trust and that's not to mean like oh I'll give you everything you want oh you're a diva and i'll do it that doesn't mean that that means treat them fairly treat them well because if i don't do that and like you can't enforce a contract on a comedian go and do your contract says you've got to do too much this is not you know harvey weinstein fuck off like it's not hollywood yeah because the end product right they're going stage and they're like i have to fucking do it right yeah exactly everything's going to be terrible yeah there's no use to that contract i don't think to me it seemed like a much more effective strategy to actually treat them well respond to what they say, give and take. And then as they gave and take back and you went, oh, this is working. This is better than a contract. Yeah. yeah. This is you know, real loyalty between bet back and forth between two people. Yeah. I get that. It, I think it works like uh, it should work in the military too. Like the, uh, the thought that... I'm not going to tell them that they have to do it because they're in mandatory, right? And they're like stuck here for 11 months. Mm. But you're like, hey, if you're here, you want to do it like good and get somewhere or just tell everybody fuck off and stay right here when you arrive. It's like, you know, like a private and <laughs> peel potatoes, right? <laughs> And, you know, that's a good way of thinking. But it doesn't work everywhere, right? Because uh, most uh, big corporates, they need to, like, have, like, uh, like a uh, structure, like, uh, you know, like H&M. Mm -hmm. 
they need to like have a uh, your signature that you're you'll be here for like 12 months otherwise you wake up and you'll think that i don't want to do this i'm not going like i don't have any obligation sure so that's the difference between an artist and yeah okay so in, and look and, and yeah that wasn't meant to say contracts overall are useless no not at all i i guess i just meant in terms of managing an artist with their artistic output yeah um however uh and I also spent a lot of time when we founded Comedy Estonia. But uh, I also think mm. that uh, like uh, the comedians have like an, uh, they're not fle- freelancers, right? They're working for Comedy Estonia, but they don't have like contracts. That means like they're not uh, like today they're like doing Suedur, tomorrow mm. they're like uh, going on stage for Pa or something like that, right? No, they're not. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they're not. That's the thing. They're not. They're working on. Comedy Estonia shows yeah, only. Yeah, but that's just, that's like an uh, on a contract, mm. but you have this unspoken agreement that uh, you're both benefiting from each other. Sure. Right? Uh, you're you're making them money and they're making you money. Right. And that's like like an a business that uh, goes around with artists should work because. Right. At the moment when you tell an artist that you have to do this at this time, like this, it doesn't work anymore. I'm not gonna do it, and that frustrates the shit. They're out gonna of- do it, but yeah. you know, it isn't the same, right? It's gonna be good, and that frustrates the shit out of our sales manager Christina because <laughs> she has to be, you know, she can't just sell, sell, sell. We have to be extremely picky uh, about the gigs that we do, and I appreciate as a sales manager, she's. She, you know, she's trained to sell, sell, sell and sell that gig and sell that gig and sell that private show and that company party and that event. And she has to be so careful and she's learned, she's done a great job, absolutely fantastic job of learning what we do, learning how he is. And, you know, even though she knows she could sell that, she has to say, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And uh, I'm very appreciative that, you know, she hasn't got frustrated with that scenario um, that we're quite limited and we're very extremely specific i spoke to a new venue the other day and the guy looked at me and he was like like he he looked at me like no one no no entertainment has ever been as specific as you guys have before and it wasn't bad he didn't like he wasn't like you fucking diva he was just like no one's ever given us this list of details before and we're like cool 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 um it was what you're saying about spoken and unspoken with comedy estonia it is unspoken, how to say, it is, um, I think it's about developing a culture. In the early days, I had to work, I had to speak in this example much more about, they're like, why can't, you know, I was like, guys, we need to only do comedy Estonia shows. And they're artists, they're free spirits by nature. <laughs> I actually remember uh it was uh, in the time when the 32nd high school event was. Uh-huh. There was a dude named Daniel. <laughs> Remember him? Daniel Kazumagi. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he went to before like Info Bar or something like that. And I don't know what happened between you or like he wrote to me like, dude, Lewis isn't telling me, but can I uh, like come perform in your show? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, nah, what's Lewis think of this, right? <laughs> well, let's break that down. Um, because also there's then how it was then and how it is now. Yeah, yeah, of course. And now and things change. Now also I have evolved as a human being. I've evolved as a leader. Uh, we Comedy Estonia has a very certain place in things now through our hard work, which I'm happy with. Um, I've you know I was a more paranoid person back then. Yeah. I was a more unsure person of the status, and that was a reflection that I wasn't a good leader and that was also that I was inexperienced in the business and all that. So yeah, the 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 initial theory my was I'm going to put all this effort into you guys, but I need you to only do comedy Estonia shows because yeah. I'm going to put all this effort in. And I, then I don't want someone else just them being your promoter and using that effort. And that developed into this us and them mentality and particularly back then and it was hard in the beginning to convince them 
because they're artists. They're like, I want to do all the shows, of course, right? Um, and that led to incidences where, you know, Tanya, uh, Tanya decided to go do for par shows, didn't tell me, didn't talk to me about it, didn't do anything. And I will admit there was ego involved in that. Absolutely. So then I went, you know what? No. Nah. And we'd already built a group dynamic, a group culture. Yeah, I think that's where, where trust, again, mm. comes in, right? Because uh, you're promoting him. Comet Estonia has had like I don't know, three open mics per week. He does uh, all these bits, uh, working on the bits. And then he goes to like Foppa, right? And I get that maybe you, you felt betrayed, right? Or something like that. And I also see, like, I think it would be much better if you just told you, right? Right. So there's two sides there. Yes, I think I would have liked to be told. But no doubt there's a factor of my ego there, which I've tried to deal with. And to, because that was only going to lead me to a dark place if I kept on with that level of ego yeah, yeah. with that thing. Um, but so there certainly was in the earlier days this very strong feeling of us and them and, and all of that but that has come around yeah because now it's comedy stone is like a monopoly in Estonia. well yeah we're so fucking big now i might say like oh i'm such an enlightened person yeah when you're doing 52 shows a month yeah i heard that one yeah like okay i can uh, you might say i can afford to be enlightened i see the you know what's the balance there um no, but it took a it took a lot of because what what it took was detachment of Lewis from Comedy Estonia because in the beginning and certainly in those days it was it was like Lewis and Comedy Estonia could not be separated yeah. and we've done a lot of work to separate those so there's a whole there's whole all kinds of shit that happens without me and that this now comes back to this idea of commander's intent that Henrik and Hella know the boundaries that they can work in which are pretty broad. And they go and do it. And yeah, there's yeah. all kinds of shit that happens without me now. And I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's again, mission-based. like Mission-based. That's what I want out of this. So, um, you know, I know a few of our guys go and do their shows, the Foppa shows. I know that uh, I have myself, but also Daniel and uh, uh, Roger have uh, given a, an invite to Matthias to come to our shows if he would like. That's open to him. Um you know, I know that I was extremely strict in the past and that I know I had to evolve past that, uh, you know, and that led to incidences like that. Yeah, but then again, you were a leader, right? Sure. And uh, put it in the army's uh, perspective, right? You have a soldier does his thing, right? Ordinary every day. And one day he, like, just fucks off and deals like, I don't know if you were like <laughs> yeah. uh, if you were uh, an sure. opposite size, he went to the Russian army, right? Sure. You were like, "What the fuck are you doing, right? Why did you throw me at least, right?" And I get that, but I also seen like uh, an uh, improvement, uh, no doubt, because I remember when I was in the mandatory, I got an offer, right, uh, from my high school friend. They were like having taught the pavad or something like that, and he asked me to perform there. Or pay like stuff like that, mm. and uh, I wrote to you, I think, and I asked if it, is it okay, and you were like, well, yeah, why the fuck, <laughs> why shouldn't it be? And then the next question was like, I'm getting one hundred dollar for this, is that okay? And you wrote to me like, yeah, God it gets like fifty for a <laughs> private, <run." laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, sure, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. But th it shows like uh, same with the Estonian Defense Forces. It's like mm. always you can think back like what you were then, and you you can only like study from it. Sure. You can't like hate yourself or something like that. Yeah, you, I know. You can only like uh, I did this wrong, and this made uh, that person feel uh, bad, right? So I and I didn't get any satisfaction, like any. Mm. It wasn't a good. It wasn't a good outcome in the long term. Yeah, yeah, I and. You can only reflect from it, right? Mm -hmm. And the next time you have something that you will make a better decision. It doesn't have to be the right decision, but it is better. 
and like when you have it like five times <laughs> you can just tell them up straight that you're not going to go for fucking pop bar even uh. when they are not <laughs> <laughs> so with stuff like that like um yeah i mean i, I guess the w- the way that even uh, with private shows right now, I might think about that, that maybe somebody uh, approaches one of our comedians and says, hey, come to the party. What eventually kind of worked out in that one is at first, actually, I kind of just let him do it. And what it turned out is they were all terrible experiences. Oh that, yeah, I fucking hated it. They were all terrible because experiences. There was yeah. like a comedy <laughs> throwing a sign. <laughs> There's like, and here is Serki Hoyt. They were like, who the fuck is is he gonna sing a song and I was like (laughs) I have a small penis (laughs) and they were like usually you laugh right so yeah so there was a certain level of letting them go and then them going like, oh is yeah, it, now I see are the value. You like, a, like a mother, like a little bit. Yeah, go, go, go. and see if it's better. Yeah. Like to be in. We don't want to be like a piece of fucking shit about it. And they come back. It wasn't better. Yeah, like okay, or well, more that I guess we've had that a little bit more that it was, um, you know, it would be like, hey, my friend's having a birthday party. I'm like, cool. Well, look, I understand. There's no money in that anyway, right? My friend's yeah. having a birthday party, and uh, he asked me to come and do, you know, 20 minutes. I'm like, right on, go and do it. I, you know, don't need to be in the middle of that. But they would invariably have a bad experience, and then go like, <laughs> oh, shit. and then be like, okay, we get it now. We get why there's a sales manager. We get why there's somebody asking yeah, all the yeah. questions and putting up the speakers and doing the introduction, and that's what it is. I want to know actually yeah. how I came to Estonia. I remember I went to uh, San Diego show in uh, Waterland, I think it was. In. Oh, yeah, geez, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a long time, of four or five years, right? And I went there with my, uh, uh, then she was my girlfriend. Now she's, I don't know what the fuck she is, right? Nobody. <laughs> she's my nobody. And, uh, you can say X, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you can just go X. <laughs> and uh, Karl Alari was the stage, right? Yeah. And I was like, now I write to Sander, probably won't answer. Mikael won't answer. I'll write to Karl. <laughs> <laughs> the fat guy will answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote to Karl. There's a sh- uh, show at my school. They have like uh, bands and stuff like that. Nobody's heard of them. Want to come to a gig? <laughs> <laughs> Karl's like, uh, we don't do that. <laughs> And like uh, two months, I was in, uh, like, I, I watched like YouTube, right? And I was like, ah, fuck this. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I was trying to impress a girl, right? Nice. Of course, that's why we're all doing comedy. And she came there and like, friend zoned me for the. <laughs> from there until like now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like. First, like I got there, and there was like straight up bullies in the crowd, uh-huh. like people who like made f- made fun of me. I don't know all kinds of stuff, and they've all girls, right? And I remember I was on stage, and I looked one of them in the eye, and I froze because all that I could think of was like, "Fuck you, uh-huh. fuck you, and your fat fucking ass," right? <laughs> because she did have a big ass. <laughs> That is a very common reaction as a stand-up comedian. Just look at the audience and be like, you know what, go fuck yourself. But you can't do that, so you got to think of something yeah, funny to say. I, yeah, I get that <laughs> t- because as a comedian, right, you're like, uh, for me, like when I know like the last one didn't work, <laughs> what the fuck is going on? Yeah. You're like, you're like, get one face out of the crowd and you're like, fuck you. And you see them after the show and you're like, stab them and they die and you go to jail it's crazy <laughs> but this is what you're, you're trying to do over time is to understand that stand up is a craft and if you do you try and you try then you get better at it and you learn how to do it and you know oh yes at first okay you're a, you're, you're a angry young man and that's yeah, yeah. probably more what's coming out before you sort of got it that okay if I just do this a whole bunch of times then I'll actually know how to deal with this situation. It's a skill. Yeah, because there isn't like a school, or there are classes how to write a joke. Well, yeah. Like the yeah. uh, premise, punchline, all stuff like that. But 
But it's actually it be interesting what you say about that. I was talking to Kevin and, and, and Cyril last night, uh, two of our new comedians, about this. Because we were talking about comedy Latvia. And there is a, such a thing as comedy Latvia, which my listeners probably know about. And they've probably got about five or six in their core group. And they're not as... Uh, how are you like involved in that? So I'm a co-owner of that. I've helped to f- uh, found it. I'm um, lucky. Um, uh, co-owner in the whatever the company is not. Like this, dude, Comedy there's no, Baltics. There's no money. There was Comedy Baltics was a brand we were using at the beginning until I understood that nobody has allegiance to the word Baltics. Oh yeah, because that's like yeah. Uh, who gives a know. shit? Like no. It's and then the, 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 it was funny because the Latvians. We used to in Latvia. We used to call it Comedy Baltics, and the Latvians were fine with that. And you'd like, no Estonians going to a comedy Baltic show. Like, fuck you, Latvia, Lithuania, motherfucker. Like, in Estonia, it had to be comedy Estonia. Yeah, yeah. But that was kind of the joke that the Latvians were willing to accept comedy <laughs> Baltics. But we changed. I understood that that was a dumb name. And we just changed it to comedy Latvia straight up. And we have comedy Latvia. And the thing that. And look, those are good guys, and we have a uh, we employ a project manager there, like a young guy, Ivars. He's really doing a great job. They got good mics. So, are you running the company from here? Not how to say I am. Like, I am one of the leaders, but not not quite day to day because I'm not on the ground. Okay, with them. it it works the same in uh, like uh, in uh, the defense forces. Like mm. you have the whole boss yeah. who runs it, but there's like. Uh, Brigades, right? Yeah, okay. So, like, they run the Brigades and the owner, not the owner, (laughs) but the uh, main leader, like, tells, Uh like, this is the after act. And the Brigade brigade leader, Mm. like, uh, takes it in the information and, like, acts according to it. Sure. As he's his best. So, we have on the ground, I think Dana's there right now, Edgar's is there right now. So, I have equal, like, my. Co-owners, co-founders, yeah, Donner yeah. and Edgars. But I'm there. I come in. I provide some leadership, some experience. I do the best I can. But I'm not a very. I'm not good at. It's hard to lead directly from four hours away. Um, so I give a call every week with them, or yeah, the best yeah. that I can, and, and try to do that. But the way that um, the, a little bit of the reason why comedy Latvia hasn't quite advanced to the level yet that comedy Estonia is now. First of all, that I wasn't on the ground in Latvia. Yeah. So I was here, I could push, push, push. I had, and all of a sudden there's this Sander guy and I'm like, huh, you're really interesting. You're really skilled and very focused on this. Okay, let's get, let's do it. Um, and I wasn't able to be on the ground with them to push them and to, yeah. to be with them. The next part is that if back in the day with Comedy Estonia, because it's like, if you just have a little isolated group of people with anything, it's like, how do they learn? How do they know? Actually, remember the uh, 32nd high school event? Yeah. It was a part of my... Uh, everybody in high school has to uh, write the paper, right? About something. Like, most people choose, like, psychology or something like that. Mm. <laughs> I was a dumb cunt. Like, I want to do comedy, right? <laughs> and actually, I remember, like, uh, reaching out for you, like, the origins of uh, Comedy Estonia and my... Uh, the teacher who was like uh, helping me, he was like, how the fuck do you know how the comedy Estonia or like comedy in Estonia Uh became to be? Because for most of Estonians, that's what comedy Estonia is. Comedy in Estonia, made in Estonia, right? Mm. He was like, how do you know how that happened? I was I just fucking asked him. That's the guy. (laughs) I asked the guy, right? He he was on stage like (laughs) last Friday. He's drunk. He'll say anything. (laughs) Um, yeah, and so the way that we were able to look, because it's like, okay, so we're this group of comedians in Estonia, but we're isol- we're physically isolated. Yes, there's the internet and all that. But the way that we learned was that we were bringing over two international comedians every month. There was the tour. Yeah, and yeah. we were going to like Tartu and Tallinn and Riga. So we're spending like three to four days every month with two international comedians. And there's a lot of transfer of knowledge in that time. Even down to things like the the bucket system at open mics where we ask for a donation. Yeah, yeah. We learn it from them. We just went to Edinburgh Fringe Festival and also they came here. They said, here's the tricks. Here's how you, here's the techniques. And he, and we went, oh, okay, here we go. And Latvians didn't have that. Yeah, we did some English shows, not as many. So they, not only are they physically isolated in Latvia, they don't have 
you know, me as a strong leader, you know, providing that first spark. And secondly, they don't have lots of international comedians coming through just telling them about comedy and shit like that. So we, it took us a long time to get Comedy Latvia off the ground, but we're getting there now. The crew is good. We've got a good project manager there. They're doing some shows all around Latvia. They have a yeah, summer yeah. tour, not, not summer tour, they have an autumn tour like we do. Um, they're taking the best knowledge that we have. And But I think comedy is, to run Comedy Estonia is a lot easier than, uh, not a lot, but a bit easier to run like Comedy Latvia because Latvia as itself is a bigger, hmm. you know, surface area. That's why I think you don't get like comedy America, right? Because you can okay. like run comedy America in California, right? But mm. then, okay, let's talk. Let's next open mic is at comedy California, right? Okay, uh, cool. or, I think like, you're on it, but you're on it, but not almost, right? Latvia is not that much bigger. Yeah, all yeah. the big, but 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 what might affect Latvia? is okay i i really think number one i'm not trying to say like oh it's all about my leadership i mean any leadership right i don't particularly mean me but it's like we didn't have a good leader on the ground there right yeah so that's number one but with your geography thing um okay at least Ta- estonia has tal and tato yeah latvia has no tato like it's a real fucking drop off after riga <laughs> Like there's no like the the comedy Latvia yeah, doesn't do. Do you know what the second biggest state of uh, Latvia is? What is it? Vilnius. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no second like south southern like yeah, the comedy yeah. Latvia only does Riga typically. Um, I know that when they do a tour with Rudolfs, who is like more or less the Sander of Latvia, uh, you know, then they go to all the some different towns, right, and stuff like that. But there's no regular shit happening in a second city. So that I think is more of the factor because there is more to this point. There is in Lithuania, there's a group called Humoro Clubus run by my good friend Paulius, the Humor Club, <laughs> which sounds so hilarious when you put it in English. Would you go to some fucking thing called the Humor Club? No, but Humoro Clubus, but Lithuanians fucking love it. Um, and they are more or less the comedy Estonia of Lithuania. Yeah. And yeah. they managed to do that in their own particular way in Lithuania. And Paulus is a really good friend of mine and we've done a lot of shows together. So, and they're whatever, three million. So um, if anything, that helped them because they had a slightly bigger media so they could get, you know, they can, like there is like Lithuanian comedians who do small stadiums. Yeah. You know, like at that. Yeah, but only inside of uh, Lithuania, right? Well, actually, <laughs> uh, actually, the there's so many broadcast Lithuanians working in other countries that, uh, and and the Humoro Clubbers are so popular that they actually go on tours of the United. They do six nights in the United Kingdom in Lithuania. They've done. I know. I know for a fact they've done a tour, several tours of the United Kingdom. And I know that they've done several tours of Norway because they're all working there. It could be a good uh, base plan for Comedy Estonia in Helsinki. Not because it's all like, no offense, but it's all construction workers. <laughs> like maybe uh, maybe there are Ari's. And we're going to do Ari's show there or Ari, like a bit, right? But there's, some, there's something cultural in that as well that the Lithuanians can go to the United Kingdom and do six shows in six cities and they're all really well received, right? Yeah, yeah. Estonians in London do not give a fuck about us. Do not give a shit. Oh, they're like, we came here to get away from everything in Estonia. Go they, away. Did you learn from, <laughs> did you learn from, it, from the fucking... Did you, I think like last year you tried it. Like coming to Estonia, London or something? Yeah, a couple of times we did it. Yeah, no one came. It was great. Like 20 people came. It was a sunny day. We were like, fuck it. They're not coming. But I know, yeah. I actually <laughs> like, uh, I don't know if it's a correlation or something, but um, it uh, the thing that you can like make fun of other military branches isn't like only Estonian based. It's only it's like if you're in the military, I can make fun of you because I'm also in the military. Because uh-huh. I remember like we were in Latvia, and uh, we went to the sauna, right? And I was like, "Are you a retard?" <laughs> it's like, "Why is 
and I was like, you only have five so right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Suka, bless. <laughs> have you dealt much with the Lithuanian uh, army or military? Uh, oh, Latvian, sorry. Let's say Latvian. Uh-huh. Latvian, also Lithuanian, because uh, we're only like, uh, there's also this thing called the Baltics Defense College, right? Mm. Because uh, it goes like Baltics to NATO, like uh, the Baltics go to the NATO, right? It is, uh, I think it is the Estonia alone. Uh, so, yeah, we have the Baltics uh, Defense uh, College. So, if I want to, I become like an. Uh, really important uh, sergeant i go to politics Defers defense uh, college mm. and then uh, yeah we're all like uh, connected uh, looking at history too like uh, when russia invades latvia estonia struck too right mm. <laughs> because, that's true yeah because who have <laughs> who do we have in neighbors like uh, yeah. sweden okay there are good help right but the other side is Sarema. <laughs> got nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. So it's true. It's not like we're going to just get let Russia take Latvia and we're like, we good, guys. We <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. So it's in our mutual benefit to, to work with them. Yeah. And also, I, I think that Latvians are like, I don't know. They're kind of. Sl- I think that. Uh, Latins, they are Slavic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I thought you were going to say slow. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of slow. <laughs> okay, Slavic, because sure. Of the six fucking so yeah, slow. But Slavic, sure. They got a bit more of that going yeah, on. But Estonians, we have Slavics among ourselves, like Russians. Mm-hmm. And they're Estonians, right? B- uh, because when you go to uh, Latvia, you say, Privet. They're like, oh, Trasvidania. In Estonia, you go to like H&M. You tell Brivet and they're like, hello. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, I don't speak Russian. <laughs> right. And uh, that's because I think Estonia belongs on the like Finland, uh, mm. Sweden, in the northern countries, right? Yeah, actually, I do. Uh, as as a person who doesn't speak Estonian language, I actually feel extremely comfortable being in Lasnama. Like, a lot of times, those young Russian guys speak way better English than they do Estonian. <laughs> like, I'll go to any shop in Lasnama, no problems, and speak English to them. Like, I had to go buy uh, some stuff at the electronics shop, at the computer store, some some little thing in Lasnama, and I was just, like, straight up, like, Carl, I was like, Carl, I got this one. And, like, the guy spoke English, great. Yeah, there are, like, uh, two uh, different sides of it because <laughs> I've uh, had, like, uh, Russian-speaking people come to the mandatory service and they're, like, Privet, suck, chok, chok, suck, Russian. I was like, oh, but then get a fuck that you were saying. And I was, like, uh, by Stonsky, Pani Mayu, no, by Angliski. Let's talk in English. And they're, like, I think the blacks should go by. They're like, oh, what the fuck? Did they you can't say? do English either. No. Nah. <laughs> and they're only speaking Russian, right? Uh-huh. Or broken English, very broken. <laughs> or uh, broke, very broken again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's like, I don't know, it's funny because, uh, again, all schools in Estonia have to teach us. Estonian, but it doesn't work if the teacher is also Russian. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they're like, "I patom chuka chuka chu ya sienon but chuku chuku chu." Right? <laughs> it doesn't work if you're teaching uh, Estonian in Russian. <laughs> right. It's like teaching English in Estonian. It doesn't work. Uh. I think also like mm. if any uh, Russian listeners are listening, then. Hello, Suka. Uh, Hello. It's all good. All respect. They're my brothers. We know. I look. Yeah, I buy all kinds actually, of shit online. I'm I'm all the time in Lastima because I'm always buying old electronics on Osta or Okie Dokie. So I'm always in some weird apartment building in Lastima yeah, buying actually, something. Some Russians that come to the mandatory want uh, to get more out of it than mm. uh, Estonians because uh, mm. the first thing is they want to get good at, at the Estonian because they know. They're gonna spend the rest of you have life. a hard life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're like, I had this uh, private named Ivan. Hello, mm-hmm. Ivan. <laughs> I'm gonna send this to him. Yeah. <laughs> and the first thing day he came, he was like, he came with a a guy who translated everything for him. Right. We did this for like three months, and then the next was like, 
tomorrow we won, you come alone, right? <laughs> and I'm like this. Tere hära sörsand. Suka viet. Mul on vaja abi. And that's progress, you know? Yeah, yeah. And now that guy actually wants to work for the military. Wants to like come work. Cool. Actually, and I fucking love this dude. Because again, as a as a guy, if you work like a leader, you get all this guy who don't like want to do it. And, and if you get one guy and you get him doing the thing that you want mm. and he's like, uh, at first he doesn't want to do it at all. Then you're like, makes success. And like, I don't know. That's for me, it gives like a huge uh, confidence boost, right? Mm. And also uh, another thing that I love the... Defense Force 4 is like they're not close for anything, right? If you give them idea and they're like and you explain yourself, right? Why it could work, why it should work and what can it do for you? Like, for instance Army Comedy Night, right? I loved it because uh, I'm not, I think I'm not made to be like an uh, fucking army man, like uh, me I always think that I'm made to be like an uh, performer, right? An artist. Mm -hmm. And the army like gives me a chance to uh, express myself. It makes me do like, get me to, gets me to do like army guide tonight. And the first night after I do it, not kidding, I had like 12 people like, can you do this battalion? Can you guide the minister? I mean, like, uh, the people who run Gaitsevegi, they wrote me like, can you do one for us? <laughs> <laughs> and I fucking loved it. Because, again, it's like you and comedians, right? You give something, you get something. For me, mm -hmm. I give the army like uh, great exposure. Like army is like, there's like comedians coming here. And what do I get? I get like handshakes. I get like fucking diplomas. Like <laughs> you did this for us. Like, thanks a lot. Not to sell, uh, uh, I'm doing it for personal gain. I also love to get in front of the soldiers, like, uh, talk a bit of jokes, like, I'm not a fucking uh, robot, you know? Yeah. And that helps because I've seen that after every army coming night, the soldiers are like, okay, let's do it. That's what I was sort of, because that, that's the, bringing it back to this point that we had at the beginning, that you did speak, that there are uh, there were times that you felt that when the troops knew that you're a comedian, they might look at you with less respect. And I had a theory that as you develop as a leader and you develop your actual... Actually, there's a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, uh, my classmate right now in the military school. We have uh, Sario TV. I don't know if you've heard of him. But he's like a big Estonian YouTuber. Okay, no. He used to be one of the bigger ones who made fun of like Vicky Blanet, all the stuff, everything, right? Huh. And right now he's like in the military. And when I saw the uh, list who was coming to the school, mm -hmm. I was like, <laughs> sorry, you're fucking TV. This fucking guy. Can I get an autograph or something like that, <laughs> right? But now I've like that I've seen him, he's like mm -hmm. a s different person. Huh. He has like his uh, persona, right? That he used to have in the, his show or something. But he made it work, right? And that's the thing. Like, I don't know if this will work. If me being a comedian and also in the army, because I've been all only told that it won't work. But there are two aspects, or also three. One, the boss is right, right? It won't work. The troops come in. I'm being looked at as a clown or something. Hmm. The other one is I can like make a difference. I mean, like there's me as a comedian and me as a uh, military guy, right? Hmm. This third one, I'm open up new gates. Like maybe uh, in the military, like hey, wait. You're now the guy who runs the things that soldiers don't get bored, right? Mm. Like making a new job, mm. something like that. And I think the last two ones are like positive. And I mean, I, it's like, 
I'm only 20 years old, right? Mm. And I'm looking forward because I feel like I'm doing more than a guy in my age should. That's the great thing of the military. Yeah, yeah. The young because, people get uh, that advantage, get that opportunity. Yeah, because I'm the youngest one in my school right now, right? Huh. And uh, I don't know. I feel just like uh, most of my age guys, not all of them, most of them, right? are still living with their mothers mm. and working in Finland for three three, uh, three days and going back to their mothers. And I feel like, because I haven't uh, lived with my mother since I finished <laughs> high school, right? <laughs> and right now I... <laughs> it's funny thing because I was at high school my mother was like I, I got home and my mother was like where the fuck were you you were late for mm. 10 minutes and after the first day and uh, uh, after I, I got my uh, city pass right I, I got to go home in from the mandatory I went home like bitch where's my soup <laughs> <laughs> but I think what coming back to what you're saying about um, you know is it Okay, so he, the, the question is, is it possible to be an entertainer in the armed forces yet still have the respect of your colleagues and the troops and those above you and those below you? My theory is... As long as you don't bomb. <laughs> as long as you don't bomb. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. It's possible, but you have to... Like, if you are a legit member of the armed forces, you are displaying leadership, you are doing great at your role in the military, that you are having that correct balance as much as you can between uh, being detached and leading the troops, but then also showing somewhat of your human side, not being, you know, we talked about not being a robot. If you're doing all that, like just getting on a stage does not wipe out all of that credibility that you had. Like, yeah. I don't think that, and if you have the maturity and the you know, real, like I fucking did this stuff and you know, this is what I keep on doing and you can see I'm a respected person here. I think there's, there's a possibility this can work. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, cause it sounds almost like a hobby, right? Because, uh, for instance, uh, we have people working in the army who are like uh, volleyball players, like they're in the National Squad, right? Mm. And they're famous too, right? But they play volleyball. And at the first uh, day they see like uh, new uh, newcomers, they say like, yeah, you've seen me, I'm a volleyball player. But right now, like I'm your leader. That's like according to it. And I think now thinking of it, it could work uh, mm. because I'm going to be honest, uh, the last two, a year, I've been in the working for the army. I've been like I have to choose one. Mm. Do I go all out uh, comedian or all out, uh, you know, a soldier? But right now, there are three ways I can be an all out comedian, an all out actually for an all out <laughs> comedian, an all out uh, soldier. Combining them both or be them both. Mm -hmm. Combining them both means <laughs> like. Uh, I will bring the comedy to the army. You know what I mean? I'll mm. not comedy, but you know, like uh, I'll make a new uh, spot where my job is only to like uh, make the soldiers like comfortable. Well, that's only, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. only do that. Or I will be both in the weekends, or if I can, mm. I'll make uh, jokes. Because if they're in the mandatory, they won't see me ever. <laughs> but but the way to think about okay, then then you might think, how does one view a comedian? Does one view a comedian as a a clown doing poop jokes, you know, doing stupid shit as the court jester, as this clown, right? Or B, do we view a comedian as one who is telling jokes but reflecting the circumstances of the people in front of you, talking about common things that we all share, taking light of that, showing things in a different perspective. If we view it in that way, this might actually be a really useful thing that the troops connect. They're like, yeah, yeah, he's one of us. And he is talking, yeah, you know, that you're not just a clown with a fucking funny nose and a sp spray water. Yeah, uh, again, uh, 
first when you come to a st- stage and try to make jokes, right? Mm. People are thinking that you're just trying. You're funny. You're just funny. That's all. Mm. And when they first uh, meet you, meet you, they don't think that mm, I don't know. He has a thought or something. He's just trying to be funny again, right? Mm. Uh, when I first met Sandra Eagles and I started to talk with him, <laughs> right? On stage, I, I left my balls out, right? And when I talked to him, I was like, <laughs> I, I was insulted, right? <laughs> Still am. <laughs> but I've talked to him, right? He, like when I did the army comedy night, I got all these fucking lights on the stage, the microphone. I did all of it, right? And I was like, okay, it's good. All right. And then I sent uh, a car to pick up all the comedians, right? And the show was at uh, 7, I think. And I sent the car out at uh, 5. So it... Uh, oh, the car was light. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Sandra was like, yeah, nice fucking job picking us up in the middle of fucking traffic, right? And I still think about that. Like, every day. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> and the other thing was, <laughs> like, I'm the kind of person, like, who builds up, builds up. In one moment, so I, like, get myself alone in the room and, like, oh, fucking cunts, all the fucking one of you, right? And, like, got the room and Sandra <laughs> heard me and was like, are you fucking sick or what the fuck do you have to do it, right? So I go to a hospital, right? And I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> Is there something wrong with me? There's two sides to that. First of all, Sandra, like all of us, has evolved over time. Sander, I believe, my friend, my good friend Sander, I believe I would call him, and I mean with respect, a reluctant leader. I don't think he was originally someone who saw himself as a leader, who you might typically think like, oh, this guy's a leader, you know, like, well, right, oh, he's got all the things that you need, right? But he has evolved into a very respected leader. But he took time, as we all did, as I just spoke about before. I was a piece of shit before as well, right? We all took time to grow into our roles. And Sander took his time as well to understand his place in the comedians that he and I both lead and we both lead and we're both needed. He provides artistic leadership. He has that credibility of being very talented. And he's learned to... He's a very opinionated gentleman. And he's learned, though, to um, introduce that in the correct ways. You know, over time, he was much more blunt. Now, this is just the classic, you know, development of a leader, right? He's learned how to, to do that. Yep. The other part of that is that it was your mistake for trying to get a compliment out of Sander. That's how I would- <laughs> <laughs> Don't try and get the approval of Sander. We are asked Daniel. Oh, my God, Daniel... Don't try and get that. That's the other side. You're like, when Sander tells me a compliment, I'm like, oh my God, yes. Oh, oh, I just got a compliment. I think, uh, (laughs) like, we stopped book of this before. Like, Sander is an intellectual. I think uh, he's a really smart fucking person. I think so too. Like, uh, isn't it like fourth open mic uh, at Pudel? And I was on stage and I was like, the next one's gonna be a good one. Sandra, like, we had a smoke, I was fucking 60. <laughs> <laughs> and I was trying to roll a uh, joint, not with weed, right? but you know, the tobacco. And Sandra was like, what the fuck are you doing? Just take one. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me, like, oh, Erki, the next time you go on stage, don't tell anybody that the next one is gonna be a good joke, right? Yeah. Because. First of all, you're gonna bomb, or you have to tell the best joke in the world. And actually, we had like uh, the day before yesterday, our teacher came up and he told us when work- when making a pres- presentation, do not tell that the story is a joke, right? Mm. Because the audience has to get it, right? Mm. Plus, uh, Sander is a great, great leader, I think, because he could be a great leader. Not like leading forces or anything, but he is like an intellectual, like not like an intellect, like he knows something about one subject a lot. But I feel that Sander can talk about a lot of things mm. and like he doesn't run down on subjects, right? 
he is a good leader. He's a good leader of comedians. He uh, has the credibility to back it up and he has learnt the skills over time to know how that and people look up to him and you can see that he takes that role seriously and he understands that people listen to him and he uses that in a positive way. Yeah. Even uh, though he'll still tell Daniel the most horrible things. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I remember when we were at uh, Mirko doing an open mic, I was 17 at the time. Yeah. I got a beer uh, with the tickets. Yeah. I went to, uh, got a beer, went on stage and talked about how it, hard it is to be 17. <laughs> and uh, Sander was like, Erki, next time you're 17 <laughs> or having a beer, Try not to do them at both, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tim Reed, really, you know what he did? <laughs> Tried to take me to a strip club <laughs> <laughs> at the same fucking <laughs> night. <right? laughs> I, I remember uh, uh, we went to the door and the... Uh, I have to say Alexander Popo in English. <laughs> Alexander Popo, yeah, yeah. In English. Like the guard. Yeah, the, the bouncer. Bouncer, yeah. <laughs> I love how that's now the term for bouncer. Oh, yeah, I went to the club. There was the Alexander Popov out the front. Was it Popov? No, no, it was just a guy, but he was the Alexander Popov out the front. <laughs> Alexander, too, I think he's so fucking smart. Yes, he is, yeah. 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 He's come a long way. He's uh, he's great Yeah. now. Oh, dude, the dude's hosting. He's doing private events. Yeah, yeah. So, And you know what's great about Popov? That I, I took him to a private event the other day and for people like when we talk about like it's a company party or a birthday party or something and this is not the comedy club it's a tough circumstance yeah, yeah. you got to get up at a party and just do it right and the thing that can throw off a comedian at the private event is that you get a little like oh they didn't laugh at my joke oh yeah, yeah. oh you know oh i'm a bit nervous because it's not the comedy club right popov has no fear he gets up there and he does his act because he's the bouncer the intellectual the professor the the public speaker and he just goes through it and he shows no fear Actually, and that's how he does the private show so well uh, another subject like uh when talking about uh, public speaking mm -hmm. we had this class uh, on public speaking and uh when you're going to you know perform public speaking right stuff like that i think that the first thing you need to do is uh, not the first actually maybe it is like you need to learn the audience right so okay. maybe mm -hmm. a lot of people or comedians when they go to like a lisa event or something like that and they think they'll bomb is that they're making their jokes right that is made for like uh regular Estonian people mm. but i think uh when you're going to uh, such an event you need to like uh Think about the Lisa and make fun of them, like or the Legox or something like that, right? But let's come to back to the other story. We went to our strip club oh, yes. in uh, Tartu. Mm -hmm. I remember the bouncer asked for my ID and I said I didn't have it on me, <laughs> but I'm 18, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> and I was uh, 17, right? I had this full hair, like. Uh, all stuff and uh, <laughs> bouncer looked at me and he said, "You're not 18 <laughs> plus. This club is 21 plus." <laughs> you fucked up, boy. <laughs> and Tim went, "Oh, what if I pay you 50 euro, eh?" <laughs> Tim paid off, bribed the bouncer to get you into the Tim, strip club. Fucking love the guy, right? I uh, remember the hostel in. Uh, Tartu in uh, Oh, yeah, on the square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, went there and me and Tim uh, <laughs> got sucking. And I told Tim, I have a girlfriend, right? I was like 16, 17, something like that. And uh, Tim said, or asked, have you had sex yet? And I said, no. But Tim, uh, he's got a bad ass. <laughs> I, said, ah, I don't know. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. And uh, <laughs> Tim told me, Okay, Erki, this is what you need to do. You pick a date at any f fucking Radisson Blue Hotel and I'll pay it for you. <laughs> 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 and like three months later, 
I picked Zayt. Mm. I was 17, right? And uh, it was uh, Italian rice and blue. And check that. It, 200 euros or something like that. I was like, mm. what the fuck, right? And uh, I went there with my then girlfriend, my ex, right? Oh, what was her name? <laughs> we went there, uh, you know, just like, oh, so fucking fancy. We went to Uxquake. I got so fucking drunk. <laughs> and Tim's whole point was that I had sex in the hotel. <laughs> I got so fucking drunk and I woke up in the morning. Did we have sex? No, you were too drunk. <laughs> what the fuck am I going to tell Tim? <laughs> yeah, but I love Tim. <laughs> Such a sh- sweet guy. Uh, Tim is the patron saint of comedy as though, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I remember Tim from my early days, right? I was like 16, 17. Like, I didn't uh, talk to anyone. And Tim gave me, uh, talked to me in an Irish accent at first. And I was like, <laughs> what is this guy saying? Yeah, yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah, Tere. What is Irish Jesus saying? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but I loved him so fucking much. Mm. I was just talking to him today. Yeah, we uh, he's still here. You know, he's still around. Uh, we, I was hanging out with him. We were having a grill the other day in Caleb's place. He comes over. Tim's making these amazing burgers. Tim yeah. comes over. He makes these burgers. Actually, it's I on, saw your it's fa- uh, Instagram post. And like, because of the corona, mm-hmm. I had to uh, spend a lot of time at home too. And I got into home cooking. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that post, I was like, I make better burgers, 100%. Oh, that's, and that's some sort of challenge, because that was a good fucking burger. Uh, no, if Tim's uh, hearing this, uh, yeah, let's have a challenge. Because, <laughs> you know, I started making beef jerky at home. Dang. Fucking uh, everything. And I fucking love it. Mm. Home cooking for me. And mayo. I made mayo at home. <laughs> Thanks, Sander. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sander's got those recipes. Yeah, because uh, the other thing with Sander, that's why I say that he's an intellectual, right? Because uh, okay, he's a comedian, right? You type Sander Ugas in the comedian, yeah. YouTube bar, right? The first thing that comes up is how to make omelette go to right? <laughs> That's right, the Sander cooking channel. Yeah, yeah, and I fucking love it. Mm. Hey, man, we got to wrap it up. I got to go do some things. Yeah. But uh, this was fun, man. This yeah. was cool. We this talked cool. all about the army, about leadership, about comedy Estonia, um, the good old yeah. days. Good, good old it was day, nice, man. All right, well, thanks for coming in. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks everyone for listening. See you later. Bye-bye.